I'm taking no points of order at this stage of the proceedings. Members having been given notice by both the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, order, I'm taking no points of order at this stage in the proceedings. Members having been given notice by both the First and Deputy First Minister, I, I am taking no points of order at this stage in the proceedings. Members having been given notice by both the First I am taking no points of order at this stage in the proceedings. Members having been given notice by both the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, I ask the member to resume his seat. Having been given notice by both the First and Deputy First Minister and 30 members under Starting Order 11, I have summoned the Assembly to meet today for the purpose of both an oral statement by the First Minister on the Renewable Heat Incentive Scheme and a motion on the exclusion of a Minister from office under Section 30 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998. Before we proceed with today's business, I wish to advise the House that I have received a letter from Mrs Jennifer McCann giving me notice of her intention to resign as a member of the West Belfast constituency, with effect from the 6th of December 2016. I have notified the Chief Electoral Officer in accordance with Section 35 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998. I also wish to advise the House that I have been informed by the Chief Electoral Officer that Ms Orle Flynn has been returned as a member of the Assembly for West Belfast constituency to fill the vacancy resulting from Ms McCann's resignation. Ms Flynn signed the undertaking on role of membership and entered her designation in the presence of the Speaker and the Chief Executive on the 7th of December 2016. The member has now taken her seat and I welcome the member to the House and wish her success. Mr. Officer, I ask, you to, I ask you to take your seat, Mr. Officer. I have received notice from the First Minister that she wishes to make a statement. As the statement was only, was only made available to members within the last 15 minutes, I intend to suspend the sitting for 30 minutes to allow the members to read the statement. The sitting is suspended until 11 a.m.
Members, the sitting is resumed. If the members will allow me to make a few opening remarks, then we will take point of order. Uh, members, uh, before I proceed, members will be aware that there is a requirement on me to make announcements on certain items of business to the Assembly. It is not the procedure to take points of order until that business has been transacted. I anticipate that fully that members may wish to make points of order in relation to this morning's business. I have a few remarks to make to explain the issues that I have considered this morning and will then take points of order. I have received notice from the First Minister that she wishes to make a statement. Before we commence, I advise members that the original request on the 14th of December sought to recall the Assembly for the purpose of the First and Deputy First Minister making a statement on the renewable heat incentive scheme. Subsequently, I have had a communication from the Deputy First Minister that the statement does not represent the position of the Executive Office. Having taken legal and procedural advice this morning, it is clear that my role in relation to the procedures of the Assembly, not the procedures of the Executive, and that I have discharged my responsibilities under standing orders to recall the Assembly. Earlier this morning, I wrote to the Executive Office stating that I would be content to be notified if the Deputy First Minister or another minister on his behalf also wished to make a statement. I are content to take points of order. Points of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much for that advice, but it is still clear and it is at the top of Mrs. Foster's written statement that she's going to deliver to the House that she is making this statement on behalf of herself and that you have received the correspondence from the Deputy First Minister to indicate that. But is it the convention that on behalf of the Executive, the First and Deputy First Minister are then advised by your office to make two separate statements in order to satisfy the recall of the Assembly? I would ask for advice on that. I think having taken the legal and procedural advice this morning, it is clear that my role in relation to the procedures of the Assembly, um, not the procedures of the Executive, and that I have discharged my responsibilities uh, in line with standing orders to recall the Assembly. As, as, as you have alluded to, Mr. Speaker, you recalled us on Friday, issuing a notice saying you had received a valid notice from the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, and the purpose of summoning us today was to receive a statement from the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. You have now made clear that the Deputy First Minister says he no longer endorses what Mrs Foster is going to say. That invalidates Standing Order 11, so can you explain to the House under which Standing Order you propose to proceed? I understand the frustration of many members of the House on, on, on this matter. I, I do really just want to re reiterate, earlier, earlier this morning I wrote to the Executive Office indicating that I would be willing to accept from the Deputy First Minister or in his absence another statement on his behalf from another minister. I have said it twice now, I think, I have discharged my responsibilities under standing orders to recall the Assembly. I think that's where we stand at the moment. Point of order, Point of order Mr Nesbitt. Mr Speaker, I've, I've asked you directly under which standing order you intend to proceed, and the fact that you cannot answer uh, forces me to ask again, specifically which standing order are we operating under? Uh, Mr Nesbitt, I, I suppose we are coming close to you challenging the 
uh, Chair's decisions. But, but let, 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 me, let me be quite clear. I have taken the legal and procedural advice from the officers of the Assembly. And I am content that we are proceeding with their, their advice being in line with standing orders. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, and with that said, there is an acceptance in what you've just said that allowing the statement to continue is actually undermining the jointry of the First and Deputy First Minister and the Executive Office. I think that, that really isn't a matter for me to decide. That's a matter for the Executive to address. Um, Point of order, um, Mr. Atwood. Um, putting it moderately, I cannot agree with the last comment that you've made. You have said to this House today that you will accept a second statement from a member of the Executive Office or some other minister on his behalf. Could you explain to the House how do you reconcile that, not just with standing orders, but also with the Northern Ireland Act and subsequent legislation and with the Good Friday Agreement, at the core of which is architecture that says there shall be a joint office of First and Deputy First Minister. Where do you have the authority, Mr. Speaker, where do you have the authority to say to uh, the Executive Office, make two statements? You have a duty to explain that to the House, to the people of Northern Ireland, and to all those who endorse the Good Friday okay. Agreement that established that you've, office. You've made yourself quite clear, but I, I have discharged my responsibilities under the standing orders to recall the Assembly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we were notified to come here today to hear a ministerial statement. The order paper decrees that we're hearing a ministerial statement. I presume the order paper is issued under your direction. Can you therefore indicate how this now can be a ministerial statement from the office, from the executive office, since one half of that office has withdrawn its imprimatur? Surely this no longer is a ministerial statement, and I'd ask you to rule, is it a ministerial statement? And if it is not, by what standing order is this House brought back on recall to hear a personal statement? Because I know of no such standing order. But is this a ministerial statement? We need to know that. I just, I'll take you back, Mr. Alistair, to the remarks that I have uh, previously made indicating that this morning I wrote to the Executive Office stating that I would have been content if a subsequent statement would have been made by the Deputy First Minister. I do believe that I have discharged, on all the advice that I have been offered this morning, I have discharged my responsibilities under standing orders to recall the Assembly. Further to the point of order, Mr. Oster, in this instance. Could you rule? Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. Uh, Mr. Alistair has the floor. Very much about. Uh, could you rule whether what it is intended we will hear is or is not a ministerial statement? Um, I still persist that if this statement is allowed to go ahead from the First Minister, it is actually undermining the joint up approach of the Executive Office, and I believe you're actually setting the President down. I was, the Assembly was recalled at the request of the Executive Office. I do believe that I have discharged my responsibilities. The matters around that are then for the Executive itself to deal with. A point of order, Mr. Farry. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it is readily understood and indeed backed up by legislation that this is a joint office. The office cannot issue a press statement, they can't issue a line to the, to the media, they, they, they can't uh, answer separate answers to oral and written questions. Every single decision emer emerging from an office has to be signed off by the two halves of the office. Therefore, I add my voice to, to the, the, the request for clarification as to how this can actually be taken forward, because the, the Assembly was recalled on the basis of a statement from the Executive Office, which clearly we do not have. And would you therefore clarify 
Are we actually, in fact, receiving a personal statement from the, per the person who happens to be First Minister, as opposed to a statement in the name of the Executive Office? Thank you, Mr. Farry. And, uh Again, I do understand the frustration of members uh, within the chamber on the matter. Um, the, the matter is, is a matter for the executive. The decision is a matter, has been made by the executive, uh, and it really is my responsibility only to discharge understanding orders the recall of the assembly. And I believe that with all the advice that I have received from the officers, that we have recalled the Assembly in line with my responsibilities and in line with meeting the procedures of the Assembly. Point of order, Mrs Long. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can you clarify, um, on the basis that you're proceeding today, do we now expect the, order, the standing orders of the House to be changed so that both the First and Deputy First Minister will answer oral questions, that both the First and Deputy First Minister will have an opportunity to make a statement on every issue that the Executive Office brings to the House in order that this will be done in a consistent manner? Uh, that would not be a, a, an, an ideal situation, but um, it, it is not a situation of my making. Um, we have to start our responsibilities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Can I bring you back, Mr. Speaker, to the original request by the uh, First Minister and Deputy First Minister on behalf of the Executive Office to uh, bring forward a statement on RHI today? And clearly, when that original request was made, uh, circumstances were, were different. But in a fluid situation, it appears that events have overtaken that. And it's clear now that that statement wasn't, uh, uh, the, the current statement has not been made with the agreement of the Deputy First Minister. Surely, then, that, ish, that item of business for which the Assembly was recalled, with other items of business, but that item of, of, state, of joint statement on behalf of the Executive Office would then fall, allowing the second and principal item of debate, the, the motion of censure, and with some amendment, the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party could have made her points in respect of this scheme. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy, for his uh, point of order. Um, but I have received a valid request to recall the Assembly from the Executive Office. Point of order, Mr. Nasbitt. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you say you've written to the Executive Office. Can I ask you, did you get a response, and if so, what it was? And specifically, are you content that the independent member of the Executive Claire Sugden had the opportunity to make a statement today. I haven't received a, a, a reply from the Executive Office uh, as yet. Um, the Executive uh, Business is really. I have received no request from Claire Sugden. I've received no request from Claire Sugden. I'm not quite sure. We haven't taken a point of order from Mr. McCann as yet. We'll let Mr. McCann at this stage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you have repeated on a number of a number of times over this past 30 minutes or so that you are content that we are proceeding uh, on a proper basis. Well, Mr. Speaker, with all respect to you, uh, it's nice to know that you are at ease with the decisions that you are announcing with regard to procedure. But not everybody would agree. There, and it seems to me, uh, Mr. Speaker are in that since no statement can be made on behalf of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, which was the basis on which we were called here, I believe we have no proper way to uh, proceed. Isn't it the case that what ought to happen now is that we should proceed as quickly as it can be arranged procedurally and in relation to precedent to an election 
to this House because it is perfectly clear that it is not operating as intended. It is not operating in a way that serves the interests of the people of the North. And procedurally, it seems to me that we are now in La La Land and Limbo Land. Please, can we sort of stop this charade? I, I, have, I, have received, I have received advice this morning from the officers, and I have discharged my responsibility under standing orders to recall the Assembly. And I'll take a point of order from this side. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Members have an obsession here this morning in terms of process. The same members who have been calling for clarity around the RHI scheme. At what stage, uh, Mr. Speaker, are we going to let the First Minister speak, given you have outlined that you have taken procedural advice from your officials and taken legal advice? At what point, uh, Mr. Speaker, are we going to proceed to hear the statement that many people from outside of this chamber actually want to hear from the First Minister? Can I, can I, can I, can I just ask the members to take their seats for a minute? Look, if members are going to continually raise the same point of order, we are not going to go forward on this matter. So can I ask members if they have a different point of order to raise other than the ones that I have addressed under the recall within my responsibilities to recall the Assembly, then I will hear those points of order. Point of order. I, I, I again repeat, Mr Speaker, that even given the remarks from the DUP whip, that he is indicating that the First Minister is making this statement to give an account of the RHI scheme without the consent of the Deputy First Minister, I would appeal again to the advice given to the Speaker that this is actually challenging the integrity of the office, of the Executive Office, and I would ask for that advice to be considered. That's, that, that really is a matter for the executive. I have considered all my responsibilities under the request that was lodged for the assembly to be recalled. Um, uh, Mr. Speaker, I have to say to you that I don't understand your ruling and how you can reconcile that ruling either with the notice that all of us received in this chamber or reconcile it with the Good Friday Agreement the democratic will of the people of Ireland uh, and our standing orders. Consequently, given that you are relying upon what you refer to as legal and procedural advice, I am saying to you, Mr. Speaker, that you must release as a matter of urgency and now the legal and procedural advice that you received before this meeting proceeds, because the consequences, the consequences in law and politics of what you are proposing, you need to have your eyes wide open. The member has lodged his, has, his request has been recorded. Your point of order has been recorded. Point of order. Point of order uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, we fully accept, which is why we are here, that your original notice and the original intention to recall the Assembly to hear a statement on behalf of the Executive Office was entirely valid. However, it is now clear that the Deputy First Minister has withdrawn his consent for such a statement to be made. Does that not, therefore, invalidate this sitting of the Assembly? And can you clarify for us the consequences, both political and procedural, of continuing down this road where we have one half of a double-headed ministry presenting to the Assembly without the consent of the other. I agree with the member that we are not in an ideal situation. I understand the frustration of many members uh, this morning. Uh, I did take the initiative to write to the Executive Office stating that I would be content to accept a statement from the Deputy First Minister, and the Deputy First Minister declined uh, that invitation. Mr. Speaker, uh, it is quite clear that the standing orders of this chamber have been stretched to their limit this morning with regards to uh, the ability uh, to hear uh, effectively what is a private member making a private statement to the House with regards to this matter. She no longer has the confidence of the Deputy First Minister in making this statement. And it is my belief, Mr. Speaker, that you need to advise the House under what standing order you are allowing this unusual arrangement to proceed if that is your decision.
I am content, Mr. Dixon, that I am complying with the requirements of Standing Order 18A. Point of order, point of order. Point of order Mr. Nesbitt. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the last 53 minutes have been a disaster for the integrity and reputation of these institutions. Could I suggest you call another short adjournment, summon the whips, and see if we can find a way forward? The member has his point on the record. Point of order, Mr. Allister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I do not challenge at all the veracity of your original summonsing of this House, uh, faced with the request that you had. But it's quite clear that request has effectively been revoked. Hence, I press for the third time for a ruling whether or not what it is anticipated we will hear from Mrs. Foster you regard as a ministerial statement or not. Are we now going to hear a ministerial statement or are we not? Because that goes to the heart of the matter. Ms. Rouster, having taken the legal and procedural advice this morning, it is clear that my role in relation to the procedures of the Assembly, not the procedures of the Executive, and that I have discharged my responsibilities understanding orders to recall the Assembly. I call the First Minister. I call the First Minister. Mr Speaker, I am grateful to you for agreeing to recall the Assembly today and permitting me to make, take the time uh, a statement about my role in the Renewable Heat Incentive Scheme. Unlike the normal practice, which by the way you endorsed, unlike the normal practice on these occasions, I want to make it clear that this statement has not been cleared or approved by the Deputy First Minister. I felt it was important that I come before the House at the earliest opportunity. For almost two weeks now, there has been a barrage of media coverage on this matter, including wild claims and allegations, many of which have been based on spin rather than reality. However, Mr. Speaker, this morning I want to set out the actual facts to the Assembly. To repeat what I've already said in media interviews, I also want to make it clear that in order to get to the bottom of this entire issue, I am prepared to waive the normal convention and to give evidence to the Public Accounts Committee. Mr. Speaker, the one issue on which we can all agree is that there were shocking errors and failures in the RHI scheme and a catalogue of mistakes, all of which coincided to create the perfect storm, resulting in the position in which we now find ourselves. In all of this, it is critical that lessons are learned and that the costs of the scheme are brought under control. As First Minister, I am determined that this will be done. Mr Speaker, today I want to cover in some detail the establishment of the scheme, the operation of the scheme and the eventual closure of the scheme. I want to set out the policy objectives behind the scheme and the flaws that there were in its operation. I also want to address some of the more common questions that have arisen over this past two weeks and, most importantly, to put to rest some of the myths that have grown up around the scheme. However, I also want to make clear that this is not a statement setting out every failing and flaw in the scheme and the process, every missed opportunity and every mistaken assumption. That work has and will continue to be carried out by the Public Accounts Committee. Before I move to the chronology of what occurred, I want to say a few words about ministerial accountability. By convention, ministers are answerable to the Assembly not only for their actions and decisions, but for those of civil servants in their department, regardless of any personal responsibility for actions or omissions by officials. In practice, ministers determine their de departmental policies and delegate the implementation of these policies to officials. It is the departmental accounting officer, normally the permanent secretary, who is responsible for the stewardship of resources within the department's control. While it may have been lost amidst the media hype, I am on record as saying I entirely accept that I am accountable to the Assembly for the actions of the Department during my tenure as Minister. I am sorry that the initial scheme did not contain cost control measures and that there were fundamental flaws in its design. This is the deepest political regret of my time in this House. As Minister, I accept responsibility for the work of the Department during my time at Dete. 
Once again, for the avoidance of doubt, I believe it is right and proper that I answer to this Assembly for my role in the RHI scheme. And not for one moment do I seek to shirk or avoid that responsibility. But if we are to learn lessons from this entire experience, it is essential that we know exactly where things went wrong. The non-domestic RHI scheme was introduced in November 2012. It supports the UK ob objective of contributing to the EU-wide target that by 2020, 20% 20 of energy consumption should be from renewable sources. The UK share of this target is 15%, and the plan is to achieve this through a combination of 12% renewable heat and 30% renewable electricity by 2020. In Northern Ireland, the renewable heat target is 10% by 2020. The non-domestic scheme incentives incentivizes the uptake of renewable heat technologies such as biomass, heat pumps and solar thermal installations. It provides payments for 20 years based on the heat energy generated. The level of tariff is dependent on the size and type of technology and the calculation of the tariff was intended to cover capital costs, operating costs and non-financial hassle costs over the lifetime of the technology. A domestic RHI scheme was introduced in December of 2014. There was an increase in application numbers during 2015, which escalated quite rapidly to produce the crisis we now face. Focusing on the incentive for small to medium-sized biomass boilers, the scheme provided a tariff of just over 6, six pence per unit. Just under £38 million of funding was provided by the Treasury for the Northern Ireland RHI schemes during the five-year period 2011-16. However, scheme uptake was initially low in the first few years, with only 409 applications received by the end of 2014, leading to an underspend of around £15 million during the first four years. <coughs> The total number of renewable heating installations under the non-domestic scheme has increased to over 2,000 by the time the scheme was suspended in February of 2016. Current estimates suggest that around 6% of our total heating needs in Northern Ireland are now met through renewable heating technologies. In addition to the resultant reduction in CO2 emissions, the local Northern Ireland economy is benefiting from the ongoing investment through the RHI schemes. That investment brings benefits in terms of job retention and creation in the energy services sector. And I make these points simply to underline that however bad the execution has turned out to be, the aims of the scheme were good and necessary. One question that has been asked by many people is why we did not simply replicate the Great Britain uh, arrangements into Northern Ireland. And the answer is quite simple. In Great Britain, the main obstacle to the growth of renewable heat was and is the wide availability of affordable natural gas. Here, the main heating fuel is oil, and the gas market is relatively immature. It was even more so in 2012. Hence, it is clear that to simply import the GB arrangement to the Northern Ireland market at that time would not have been appropriate. Mr. Speaker, while this statement is not the place to rehearse every failing or flaw in the process, there is one matter which I believe it is, is important that I address, for it is this error that goes to the very heart of why the costs of the scheme ran out of control. The crucial mistake in the scheme was that the tariff for the most commonly used boilers, small to medium biomass, was set at a level higher than the market price of the relevant fuel, mainly wood pellets. In essence, this created an incentive to continue to burn fuel over and above the levels required for the relevant function, <coughs> whether a commercial business operation or a community facility, such as a nursing home or a church. Of course, the regulations do not provide for payment for wasted heat or heat that has no functional benefit. However, as the PAC has exposed, a further major failing of the scheme here has been that the necessary aspects of the regulations have not been rigorously enforced. There clearly should have been more and better inspections of businesses long before the summer of 2016. This is the heart of the RHI story, the tariff subsidy being higher than the cost of the wood pellets. Yet Detty's 2012 business case on RHI wrongly stated that the tariff was lower. This crucial misunderstanding informed Deddy's attitude to RHI in subsequent years. It helps explain why concerns were not taken seriously enough and why action was not taken quickly enough when problems emerged. With the greatest of respect to those who criticise me for this, I would remind them that I did not simply impose a scheme on the people of Northern Ireland. 
The tariff was set out in Schedule 3 of the legislation, which was scrutinised by the Enterprise Trade and Investment Committee and passed after debate by the Northern Ireland Assembly. Indeed, the chair of the committee, Mr Patsy McGlone, MLA at the time, said, and I quote, the committee scrutiny of the development of the renewable heat incentive has been considerable and reflects the importance and long-term nature of the proposals. Before supporting the RHI, the committee sought and received assurances on incentive and tariff levels, banding levels, incentives for domestic consumers, payments to participants and support levels for the renewable heat premium payment scheme. The unfortunate reality is that no one in government or in this assembly in their work creating and passing this legislation picked up on this crucial failing. And contrary to some accounts in the early years of the scheme, this was not widely picked up by the industry either. In fact, as has been previously stated during the time I was the minister responsible, Northern Ireland was underperforming in this area. In my years as Minister, there was an underspend on RHI up to and including my final year at Detty, 2014-15. This is detailed in the Northern Ireland Audit Office report. Take-up in its early years was low. Indeed, hard as it is to believe now, there was even a publicity campaign in 2014 to encourage more applicants. The BBC Spotlight programme and subsequent comment has made significant play of a concerned citizen and I would ask the entire Assembly, if they were here, to join me in thanking that person for all she did to try to prevent the calamity that we have fallen into. She deserves our highest respect and a sincere apology on behalf of my former department, which should not have dismissed her claims with disbelief, but examined them with diligence. It is no exaggeration to say that had she been listened to on any of the three occasions when she approached Eddie, the crisis would have been avoided. Unfortunately, it has been difficult to establish the exact facts around contact between the concerned citizen and myself and the department. When asked by Spotlight about correspondence from the concerned citizen, I replied, I pass these concerns on to the departmental officials to investigate. It is now obvious that these investigations should have highlighted the failings of the scheme and ameliorative action should have been taken. I made this statement from memory and on advice that appeared to indicate that she had raised her concerns directly with me. This is also my normal and indeed the appropriate practice to pass any concerns received from members of the public to the relevant departmental officials. Mm -hmm. However, my response was made without the benefit of having reviewed the concerned citizen's original letter. It is now clear that the initial communication to me did not raise concerns with the RHI scheme and I understood from the Department of the Economy officials who have spoken to the person in question that this was the only correspondence sent directly to me. However, a subsequent email to my private account the following week has now come to light in which there is a reference to concerns about the scheme. Mr Speaker, it has also been alleged that I contributed to the problem by putting the introduction of the domestic RHI ahead of cost controls on the non-domestic scheme. It is quite wrong of anyone to describe this as a smoking gun. I make no apology at all for having pushed to see the domestic scheme introduced, as that was a totally legitimate and rational decision on the information available to me at the time. I did not receive any indication that cost control of the non-domestic scheme was an urgent priority at that time. And the Department of the Economy is seeking to establish the facts as to why the warning signals that have been given, not least those from the concerned citizen, were not escalated within the department. And it is important that this work progresses to a conclusion as soon as possible. So to sum up, at no time during my period as minister were any recommendations made to me to introduce cost controls, nor were there any warning signs that spending on the scheme was spiraling out of control. In fact, during my time in the department, there was an underspend of the money available to us. I now want to turn uh, to touch on the period after I left the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. In May 2015, I became Finance Minister and had no role whatsoever in relation to the decision of the Deti Minister to amend the scheme. The then First Minister, Peter Robinson, has also made it clear that he was unaware of the issues around RHI as they had not been brought to him as either party leader or First Minister. Therefore, at no time did he seek to intervene either. Let there be no doubt, the decision in relation to the amendment of the RHI scheme was a matter for the Deti Minister. The timing of the introduction of cost controls was entirely a matter for him. It has been suggested that my party sought to influence the decision in relation to the timing of the introduction of the cost controls. 
It has only been in recent days that I have been aware of this allegation and have now taken the opportunity to investigate it. The only person who would have been in a position to instruct the Deputy Minister would have been the First Minister at that time. This has been checked with the First Minister, who has made, who, the then First Minister, who has made it clear that the problems surrounding RHI were never brought to him either as First Minister or party leader. He made it clear that therefore he could not and did not intervene in any way. No other minister took any role in this matter, nor did they make any representations in relation to it. I can confirm that the DUP party officers took no interest or role in the question of the RHI. Therefore, regardless of what, if anything, was said in relation to the role of the party, no one had any authority to instruct the Deputy Minister to do anything. I would add that there is no evidence whatsoever of Mr Bell raising any concerns with the First Minister if he felt that he was being pressurised. Let me make it absolutely clear. Any suggestion that the Enterprise Minister was instructed to delay the changes to the RHI scheme is totally without foundation. By way of a submission from John Mills, the then Director of Energy Division in Deti, on 31 December 2015, a recommendation was made to the then Minister to close the RHI scheme due to concerns over an overspend. The Minister agreed to this proposal. A subsequent submission from John Mills of 19 January 2016 recommended steps to close the scheme by early to mid-March 2016. These submissions were based on the assumption that conventional processes of consultation and committee clearance were required. The Minister signed off on this submission on Friday the 22nd of January, agreeing to the early to mid-March closure. However, as a result of concerns, a hold was put on this decision within half an hour. In late January 2016, complaints about the operation of the RHI scheme were made to me. I informed the Deputy First Minister and I passed them on to the Head of the Civil Service. I was deeply concerned that the proposed mid-March closure date, in light of the growing financial pressures and the executive, agreed on the 5th of February to a closure around the 15th of February. Immediately after the announcement of the early closure of the scheme, concerns were raised in relation to those who had already installed boilers but had not yet applied, who would be disadvantaged, on the basis that one, cost control measures were now in place. Two, there was a danger of legal challenges to those who had installed boilers but had not yet received authorisation. And three, with the agreement of senior civil servants, it was decided that the scheme should remain open for a further two weeks. As the Enterprise Minister at the time highlighted in the Assembly, he took the decision with the agreement of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. The extension of the amended scheme was an entirely proper and proportionate step to take in all of the circumstances. And once again, for the record, the scheme was closed earlier than initially approved by the Minister for Tra the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. Since the announcement of my decision to make this statement, the former Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment has given an interview to the BBC. In that, he makes a number of allegations in relation to the decision to amend and then subsequently to close the scheme. I think that it is important that I also take this opportunity to put on record the factual position in relation to a number of those allegations. Mr Bell alleged on several occasions that he took action immediately to introduce cost control measures into the scheme and signed off the submission at the most immediate point he could. This is untrue. Today my colleague the Minister for the Economy is placing in the Assembly Library a copy of the submission that was agreed by the former Minister. It will show that the Minister received a submission on the 8th of July 2015 recommending the introduction of cost control measures. It will also indicate that the original proposal from officials was to introduce cost controls from October 1, 2015, but was amended to 4 November 2015 and signed off by the then Minister on 3 September 2015. It is apparent from this document that action was not taken immediately, but after considerable delay. Mr Bell further claims that other SPADs became involved in the process who were, and I quote, not allowing the scheme to close. The fact remains that the Minister signed off a proposal which was to take effect from the 4th of November 2015. The only further delay in the introduction of cost control measures was as a result of legal and financial issues being resolved by departmental officials and were unconnected to any ministerial decision. The decision was solely for the Deputy Minister to take. 
The former Deputy Minister claims that he made a decision to amend the RHI scheme, but that he was overruled by special advisers. Since last week, I have specifically investigated this claim. The evidence is clear. The only decision taken by the Minister was in early September to amend the scheme in November. The Minister was not subsequently overruled by special advisers, and I am clear that whatever representations may have been made by anyone on this issue, it was not being done with the authority of the party. Now, I understand from Minister Hamilton that the Permanent Secretary recalls being told at the time that some in the party wanted the scheme kept open. He was unaware of the source of this suggestion, but believes it may have been based on the erroneous but widespread view at the time that because the scheme was AMI funded, that it was possible to maximise take-up without creating a problem. I have checked and confirmed that no minister made any such request or took any interest in the decision taken in September 2015. The DUP party officers took no interest in this issue and gave no instructions. It is therefore clear that whatever the belief, the DUP did not ask the Deputy Minister to extend the scheme. I also understand that when the suggestion of a four-week extension was mentioned in the Deputy Issues meeting on 24 August, the Deputy Minister did not voice any objections. In fact, he endorsed the decision. The bottom line is that this decision was taken by the Deputy Minister, and no attempt was made to overrule him, and no such allegation was made at the time. In fairness to the Deputy Minister, I, I should say that I also understand from Minister Hamilton that departmental officials did not object to a four-week extension. Mr Bell also claimed that he acted in the way that he did because of what he referred to as collective responsibility. This demonstrates a total and fundamental misunderstanding of the Convention of Collective Responsibility. The doctrine of collective responsibility refers to a convention by which once Cabinet has taken a decision, all other ministers are expected to abide by it or resign. In this case, there was no decision of the Northern Ireland Executive, nor had there ever been any conversation between DUP ministers, much less a decision on the matter. There has been no allegation from Mr Bell that the First Minister, Peter Robinson, sought to delay the change to the scheme. The issue of collective responsibility has no bearing whatsoever on this issue. Indeed, it is clear from Mr Bell's statement concerning the two-week delay in February that he could robustly defend his role as Minister and would not change his course on the basis of SPADs acting without any ministerial authority or cover. In discussing the decisions around autumn of 2015, Mr Bell also claims he has a fact that he says reveals the role uh, of special advisers in the scheme staying open. He then refers to a conversation he had with the Deputy Secretary of the Department claiming his own special advisor had been asked by other special advisers to remove references to Arlene Foster and to the Department of Finance and Personnel. This is the key allegation that documents were amended and is a crucial point. The truth is very different from that suggested by Mr Bell. I can set out the simple facts based on the official records of the Department for the Economy. Firstly, the only conversation approximating to this version of events took place in February of 2016, not in 2015. Secondly, it relates to paperwork concerning the closure of the scheme in 2016, not the introduction of cost controls in 2015. Thirdly, the deputy adviser accepts that any changes he made were made of his own volition and not on the request of others. Fourthly, the amendment that was made relates to one draft submission before it was finalised for the minister to consider, not any attempt to delete emails or government records. Fifthly, the reference that was removed was one highlighting the role of OFMDFM in wishing to see the scheme closed more quickly and without consultation. The removal of this reference had the effect of avoiding any impression that the Deputy Minister had been told that he had agreed to a process of closing the scheme, which was too slow. Sixthly, this was a submission from the Deputy, for the Deputy Minister only and did not impact on the document which was being forwarded on for the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. Seventh, and most importantly, the change to the submission had absolutely no effect on anything in the real world. The timing and process for suspension of the scheme had already been agreed. Minister Hamilton asked for urgent clarification of this issue from officials who provided a note setting out the factual position. That was released to the media last evening. 
and the Minister has also placed in the Assembly Library copies of the draft submission with the track changes marked and the final version was then approved <coughs> by the then Minister. In relation to the closure of the scheme in 2016, Mr Bell has alleged that he wanted to close the scheme immediately. Once again, let us return to the documentary evidence. Firstly, let me refer to a submission dated 19 January 2016. This proposed a closure date of early to mid-March 2016 and was signed off by the then Minister, Mr Bell. The Deputy First Minister and I believed that we should act more quickly and a further submission was prepared by deputy officials which provided three options. Minister Hamilton has also left a copy of this submission in the Assembly Library. In it, officials recommended a longer process to close the scheme over a longer period of time, but it was agreed that it should be closed as quickly as possible. So even taking into account the issue of the two-week delay that was agreed after the announcement, after all the complex processes, the simple truth is the scheme closed earlier than had initially been proposed by the Deputy Minister. This reality is that it was the intervention of OFMDFM that ensured an earlier closure of the scheme than would otherwise have been the case. To deal briefly with that subsequent two-week delay in RHI closure, let's remember it was decided after cross-party concerns that the scheme should not close within a fortnight of the announcement. Members across this House voiced concern that businesses that had just bought boilers would be left in the lurch. The two-week extension Mr Bell then agreed to as Minister was supported by myself and the Deputy First Minister. Other parties of this House, of course, wanted it to be longer. Cost controls were in place for RHI at this stage, and civil servants <coughs> were content with the two-week period. Now, this is not an exhaustive rebuttal of the allegations made by Mr Bell, but I hope it will convey with documentary evidence what actually happened. I also want to make it clear that I support the need for an independent investigation, free from partisan political interference, to establish the facts around the Renewable Heat Incentive Scheme. I believe that the conclusions of any investigation must be made public and that any investigation must be conducted speedily to assist in the process of building public confidence. Mm -hmm. I have been working to reach agreement with officials and others on the precise details of such an investigation over the last number of days, and I hope that this can be resolved in the next few days. Mr Speaker, while there will be a significant interest in how we came to the present position, the most important issue for us now is to mitigate the costs of the scheme. Minister Hamilton plans to make a statement to the Assembly as soon as possible in the new year. The hope and intent is to reduce significantly the cost of the scheme to the Executive's budget, but the details are still subject to considerable further work. This matters, as we want to be fair to all those who responded to the incentive as it was intended to operate, and also to ensure that our process resolves completely the widespread abuse of the scheme. So in conclusion, Mr Speaker, unlike others, my priority in all of this is not headline grabbing, nor is it grandstanding. My priority, just as it was when I pressed for the earlier closure of the scheme rather than let it run to March, is to ensure lessons are learned and to reduce the projected cost. When I became First Minister, I said I could think of no greater honour than to serve my country and the people of Northern Ireland. It's not a responsibility I take lightly. I am not immune to the considerable anger and frustration this issue has caused. Not only do I understand it, I feel it too. I share those emotions because I am proud of this place and I want the best for it, and that's why I entered politics. I did not enter politics to shirk or shy away from difficult decisions. The record shows that I have always put Northern Ireland first. The record shows that I have worked hard throughout my political and ministerial career to bring more investment and more jobs to Northern Ireland. The record shows that I have worked hard to keep Northern Ireland moving forward, and I will continue to do so as First Minister. And that is why, Mr Speaker, rather than whipping up a media storm, I have actually been dealing with the problem along with my ministerial colleague Simon Hamilton and with the Finance Minister on a practical solution. Because, Mr Speaker, that's what responsible politicians do. That's what government is about. On a personal note, I want very much to thank each and every member of the public who has called my office at Stormont and indeed DUP offices across the length and breadth of Northern Ireland to offer words of support and encouragement. 
It really is appreciated. I will continue to work hard, as I have done throughout my political career, on everyone's behalf to ensure a better and a more stable future for Northern Ireland. Yeah. Call Mr. William Humphrey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for the lengthy and comprehensive statement she's just given this House. Can I ask the First Minister what her view is of those who seek, say they want facts and clarity around this situation, who, when they have the opportunity to listen to those facts about the scheme, walk out of this chamber in an irresponsible way, in a media stunt to seek to draw attention and headlines for themselves, and more interested in spin and propaganda and not providing the truth for the people of Northern Ireland? Yeah. Well, I, I just don't know what to say in relation to this matter, because for weeks now, People have been calling on me to come forward, calling on me to go to the PAC. I said I'd go to the PAC. That wasn't good enough. I said I would come to this House. I would set out the facts. I would take questions from members of this House. And where are they? Where are they? The people of Northern Ireland deserve better than this, Mr. Speaker. The people of Northern Ireland will look at this today and say, what is all that about? What is all that about? But let me tell you this, having listened to people from right across Northern Ireland, and I haven't been hiding away, I've been out and about. I've been out and about in Upper Ban, I've been in South Belfast, I've been in my own constituency. I have been listening very carefully to what people have to say, and they are angry, but they want a plan as to how to deal with this. I'm setting out a plan as to how to deal with this matter, whilst others seek party political advantage. And I regret that. I regret that deeply but others have to answer for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I call Mr. Sidney Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the First Minister for her detailed statement to, to the House today. First Minister, in relation to cost controls, could you explain why the cost controls in Great Britain and the Great Britain scheme were not uh, replicated uh, in the Northern Ireland scheme? Well, I thank the member for his question. I have taken the opportunity to, over the weekend to speak to officials to establish uh, why uh, this is the case. And there are three reasons. I have to say none of them are good or none of them are very acceptable uh, because, because cost controls, of course, as we know now with the benefit of hindsight, should have been in place right from the beginning of the scheme. Uh, the three reasons are this. First of all, there was an understanding from the specialist report, the SEPA report, uh, that the tariff set was lower than the cost of the fuel, and that was the fundamental mistake, as I said in my statement. Uh, the suggested rate for biomass boilers below 100 uh, kW was set initially at 4.5 pence per kW hours. Uh, and at this rate, the consultants noted, there was no need for tiering, as at the time the proposed rate was less than the cost of wood pellets, and therefore there was no incentive to excessively use the boilers just to claim the subsidy. Secondly, uh, there was not the level of demand for the Northern Ireland RHI in the first few years. In fact, the first application for the scheme was received in January of 2013. And remember, the scheme opened in November uh, of 2012. Um, and over the first four years, there was an underspend of approximately £15 million. Therefore, it was thought incorrectly, as it turns out, that the need for introducing cost controls uh, didn't arise. And the third issue is around governance. And the governance processes uh, within the department did not enforce compliance with commitments given when the scheme was approved, including careful review of tariffs and risks. Uh, and cost control was proposed back in the 2013 consultation paper, but it wasn't acted upon. So there was no submission to me saying, we think you need to look at cost controls or this has been raised as an issue. Nothing came to me in relation to that matter. So, the cost controls in Great Britain, of course, should have been replicated in the Northern Ireland scheme. I'm giving you the reasons that have been given to me as to why they weren't replicated, uh, and of course, uh, they're not good enough, uh, but those are the reasons that were given to me. Call Lord Morrow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I too would like to thank the First Minister for her very comprehensive statement here today. I think it is most regrettable that those who have barked and shouted the most about this issue when there was an, issue, uh, an opportunity for them to learn some facts around it, what did they do? We're not interested in the facts. They just walked out, so they ran away. Uh, and I think the Minister is to be congratulated on her comprehensive report. But could I ask the Minister that uh, since there has been uh, much speculation 
as to why cost controls were not introduced when the scheme was established. Was any advice given to the Minister in 2012 about cost controls? And indeed, can the Minister tell us what proposals uh, for cost controls were considered and then rejected by the, 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 the Minister? Well, back in 2012, uh, there were no submissions to me in relation to uh, cost controls. Uh, as I've indicated in my last answer, cost controls of a sort were set out for comment in the 2013 consultation paper. And, you know, it's not unreasonable for a minister to expect that this document would have been acted upon and I would have been given a submission after the consultation closed. But, in fact, there was never a formal submission uh, responding to that part of the consultation. Um, I then went on to look at the introduction of the domestic scheme, uh, but you know, that's not a good enough reason for not bringing me a, a proposal or a recommendation in respect of the uh, non-domestic scheme. And it should have been, especially given by that stage, the, fa the, the concerned citizen had been in and she had spoken uh, to officials on a number of occasions, but yet they still, still didn't think it was the right thing to do to send me uh, a submission in relation to these issues. So I deeply regret that that was the case. Mr. Christopher Stalford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I thank the First Minister for the statement that she has made. Uh, in the precursor to it, several members were raising points of order and raising the issue of undermining the credibility of this House. Does the Minister agree with me that what undermines the credibility of this House is when elected members of this House run away from fulfilling their function of answering questions uh, in, in this place and instead choose to do so in TV studios? Well, of course, it undermines this place when members do not stay here and ask the appropriate questions, but instead go outside uh, and indulge in media spin. But unfortunately, it's not the first time that some of the members of this House have done that. We all remember the Ulster Unionist Party stunt uh, when I was appointed uh, after the election about how they were uh, going out of the executive and bring it on and all that sort of stuff. Let, what was it? Let battle begin. Wasn't that it? Let battle begin. Uh, that was when they decided not to go in the executive. So they ran away there. Of course, they'd ran away before that in relation uh, to the issue around the talks of the fresh start when they decided not to engage there as well. So this, this is not new. This is a pattern. This is a pattern, I have to say. Uh, but I don't think they serve, their, they serve their constituents well. They don't. Uh, what they should be doing. If they want to challenge me, the place to challenge me is in this House, Mr yeah. Speaker. The place to challenge me is in this House. But instead, they will stay out. They will come in this afternoon and they will put down an exclusion motion, even though they haven't been here to question me on these issues. Uh, they will come here with an exclusion motion even before the PAC have finished their investigation. But they've made up their mind about the First Minister of Northern Ireland, but thankfully the electorate has also made up their mind in relation to the First Minister of Northern Ireland. Call Mrs. Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for a very uh, comprehensive statement to the House this morning. And it's, it's quite obvious from this morning's events that uh, there are many members who should be in this chamber who do not want this devolved government to be in any way successful or succeed or to do its job in the rightful way, and that has been shown. Can I ask the First Minister uh, about the newsletter uh, published a story this morning in relation to the regulatory impact assessment? Um, I want to ask her on what basis did the Minister sign off on the regulatory impact assessment and should it not have been apparent that there was a fatal flaw at the heart of the scheme? Well, I thank the member for her question because it's an important question and I'm glad she's asked it. Um, because, uh, first of all, let me say our opponents told us today was an important day and then they couldn't be bothered to show up. Can't be bothered to show up and ask me questions in relation to the sorts of things that the members asked me a question about. In relation to the regulatory impact assessment, in, in that assessment, the department recognized uh, that setting incorrect support payment levels, the RHI tariff, uh, posed the most obvious risk to the Northern Ireland scheme. If the level was set too high, those installing renewable heat will be oversubsidised and less heat will be delivered per pound than under more optimal subsidy levels. Alternatively, if the rate was set too low, renewable heat will not be deployed to the extent uh, expected. And within that document, it was made clear that there were to be regular planned reviews of subsidy levels after a number of years of experience with the subsidy. And that would, of course, 
have provided the opportunity uh, to amend tariffs if needed uh, and to ensure uh, that they remain appropriate given the potential changing market conditions. And of course, the market does change, and we've seen that in terms of the price of uh, wood pellets, the price of oil, the price of gas. Um, and it was proposed in that RIA that the first review would begin in January 2014. Uh, with any uh, changes that were needed by the 1st of April 2015. The review did not happen. Departmental officials did not carry out that review. And I, as Minister, I believe that I have the right to expect that risks identified in uh, an RIA would be managed by officials. And as the accounting officers has explained at length to the Public Accounts Committee, uh, there were several important commitments made at the time when RHI was approved, not least in respect of risk management, uh, which were not followed through, and those omissions by officials contributed materially to the very, very serious problem that we now face, and that's already under investigation in the fact-finding work that has been discussed with the PAC, and I look forward to the outworkings of the PAC, and as I've already said on the record, I'm more than happy to go to the PAC, even though that's not the convention. I'm happy to go to the PAC, and the reason I'm happy to go to the PAC, Mr. Speaker, is I have nothing to hide in this matter. Absolutely nothing. I'm putting everything out there. I'm calling for an inquiry if we can get that arranged uh, with colleagues. I have nothing to hide. So why would other members, therefore, bring an exclusion motion to exclude me? It is all party politics, and this party will not be a part of it. Call Mr. Nelson thank you, Mr. Speaker, and could I thank the First Minister for her statement and answers to questions which bring a great deal of clarity and dispel all of the confusion that folk have generated from other supporters uh, around this matter. And could I ask the First Minister then, has she been able to ask, ascertain or establish who was responsible for the assumption that cost controls were not necessary as they thought the market price of wood pellets was higher than the tariff? I thank the member for his question. And it appears to have been uh, a mistake that was made uh, by deputy officials. The initial report from the consultant SEPA suggested rate for biomass boilers below 100 kW was set at 4.5 pence per kilowatt hour, uh, based on a 20 kilowatt biomass boiler reference case. Uh, and at that rate, the consultants noted there was no need for tiering, as at that time the proposed rate was less than the cost of wood pellets, and therefore there would be no incentive to excessively use the boilers just to claim the subsidy. Uh, the consultants were then asked to reconsider the rates following feedback from the industry uh, after the consultation process. And in February 2012, the consultants produced a new paper which increased the rates to account for a larger reference case boiler of 50 kilowatts uh, in size rather than the original 20 kilowatts reference case. The rate proposed for biomass boilers less than 100 kW was increased in this paper to 5.9 pence per kilowatt hour, but there was no mention, no mention of the need for tearing or that this was not in excess of the cost of wood pellets. So the final business case approved by DFP in mid-2012 included a 5.9 pence tariff which has subsequently been increased with inflation to 6.4 pence per kilowatt hour. And in the business case to DFP, the department stated that there was no need to consider tearing because the rate proposed was lower than the cost of fuel and therefore there would be no incentive to abuse the system by generating heat just to claim the subsidy. However, in the case of biomass boilers, this was simply not true. Uh, in fact, the cost of wood pellets was shown in the same business case as being 4.39 pence per kilowatt hour compared to the proposed tariff. So it was there. It was there in black and white what the wood pellet cost was uh, in terms of the proposed tariff of 6.4 pence per kilowatt. But, so nobody in DETI, nobody in SEPA or nobody in DFP spotted that that was the case. And therein lies the fundamental problem. Members, that concludes questions on the statement. Members, the business committee, business committee has agreed to suspend the sitting for one hour following the conclusion of questions on the statements. I propose, therefore, by leave of the Assembly to suspend the sitting until 1 p.m. The next item of business when we return will be the motion under Section 30 of the Northern Ireland Act. The sitting is by leave suspended.
Members, the sitting is resumed. Members, the next item of business is a motion signed by 30 members under Section 30 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 in relation to the exclusion of the First Minister from office. The motion for exclusion of a minister under Section 30 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 must relate to the specific terms of that section. Any amendments which take the motion outside of these terms will be inadmissible. I have received legal advice from officials that the amendment proposed by Sinn Féin is incompatible with the requirements of Section 30 of the 1998 Act and, as such, is inadmissible. The Business Committee has agreed to allow up to 30 minute, three hours for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have 10 minutes to propose and 10 minutes to wind. The First Minister will have 30 minutes. All other speakers will have five minutes. At the start of this debate, I want to note that the motion today has attracted the signatures of a wide range of parties. Whilst there is a three-hour time limit to the debate, I want to make members aware that I therefore intend to use my discretion to ensure that as many, uh, that as many members as is possible are heard from each party represented within the House. I would advise members that the vote on the motion will be on a cross-community basis. I ask the clerk to read the motion. That this Assembly, in accordance with Section 30 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998, resolves that the First Minister no longer enjoys the confidence of the Assembly and that she be excluded from holding office as a Minister or Junior Minister for a period of six months because of her failure to observe the terms of Paragraph G of the Pledge of Office and the first paragraph of the Ministerial Code of Conduct, in that she failed to observe the highest standards of propriety and regularity in relation to the stewardship of public funds surrounding the Renewable Heat Incentive Scheme. I call Mr. Colum Eastwood to move the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the SDLP brings this uh, motion before the House in the full awareness of just how serious a moment this is for our local politics. As we attempt to claw back the £400 million pounds and more uh, we may, which may be lost to our local taxpayers, let us also act to claw back the fading threads of confidence in these institutions. As we draw towards the end of 2016, let us today act to redeem and restore some faith in that public service, and that in some faith in that public service for the common and the collective good remains worth fighting for. In that context, the SDLP very much welcomes the cross-party support this motion has received. There is a reason for that unity, and the DUP members of this House would do well to take heed of it. Since entering into public life as a councillor and as an MLA, never have I seen more public, our public more engaged and more angry about a single issue. I would hazard a guess that as each of us walked around the streets of our constituencies this weekend, MLAs from across this chamber we're hearing that same disgust. Mr. Speaker, our community is united in anger. And let it be recognised here today that it is an anger which the public have every right to hold. No. The last number of months, the last number of months, Mr. Speaker, has seen a damaging pattern to our politics. The cloud hanging over the NAMA deal, the inaction on Brexit, the structure of SIF the continued funding and appeasement of a, D of a UDA boss. Amongst the many uncertainties of this last political period, there is one thing we can all say for sure. There is no fresh start here. The scandal of the non-domestic renewable heating scheme is by far the biggest imprint on that damaging uh, pattern. This is the biggest public finance scandal ever to hit these institutions. As this scandal has unfolded, it has suited some to try to muddy the waters, but we must not be distracted. This scandal must not be reduced to a psychodrama between the member from Strangford and the now First Minister. It must not be reduced to, to being just about a fallout between former friends or revised to tell only a story of a split in one political party. It is so much bigger than that. So far, digging into this scandal has uncovered staggering incompetence. Digging deeper has the potential to, co 
to uncover corruption. Therefore, let us be precise and forensic about the information which is still left unanswered. Mr. Speaker, the best place to start is always at the beginning. And whether the First Minister likes it or not, this scandal begins with her. The RHI scheme was deliberately changed from the GB model. The question still remains as to why this happened. When the scheme was drawn up in Northern Ireland, why were some of the GB regulations copied and included? Why were some not? In particular, why was Section 9 of the GB regulations not included? A section which would have established cost controls for the entire scheme. Did the First Minister advise or take advice on the inclusion of such cost controls? Move on to personal warnings received by the to the First Minister. We have now lost count as to how many times the account and the response of the DUP to the whistleblower has changed. This morning's revelations add further to the impression that the First Minister was aware of a lot more than the jot and tittle of this scheme. Did she deal with other whistleblowers in precisely the same fashion as she dealt with this lady? Move forward to 2015. When will we get the names of the 984 applicants to this scheme which were made between the months of September and November 2015? Did the First Minister advocate for the scheme and on what scale? The same question applies to your party colleagues and their staff. When did Mr Stephen Brimstone make his application? Move on to the role of special advisers. What direction and under whose control do DUP special advisers work? Are DUP uh, politicians collectively responsible to DUP special advisers or is it the other way around? In addition to de departmental files, will the DUP publish all of its internal correspondence regarding the RHI scheme? Mr. Speaker, the questions are many and the questions are detailed. For two weeks now, confusion has been met with contradiction. My party is clear. It will now require a full public judge-led inquiry to get to the full truth. It is only right and reasonable, therefore, that the First Minister, having failed to take the opportunity to step aside, is excluded from her office whilst this investigation takes place. Let it be in the hands of the person tasked with leading the public inquiry to determine whether the First Minister is fit to resume office. I note that the member for Strangford has been removed from his position by the DUP pending an investigation. Surely the First Minister should follow the same logic and accept the same fate. Mr. Speaker, the continuation in office will, will further bring deadlock to an already failing executive. Today, members were expecting to scrutinise the draft budget from the Finance Minister, yet we meet today to discuss the career of one individual. During the week, there was confusion whether an executive office press release was actually a DUP press release. Today we are informed that the First Minister is speaking without the authority of her joint office. All of this is because the DUP leader won't do the decent thing, the dignified thing, and step aside. We can't go on like this. The longer the First Minister clings on, the more her credibility will fade. And let me assure the First Minister, Christmas will not Saver. Mr. Speaker, let me now briefly turn to the First Minister's coalition partners, who, given their position, will obviously play an important role in today's proceedings. I welcome that Sinn Féin have moved on to similar ground as the opposition parties. I acknowledge that they have come a distance over the course of the last two weeks and have struggled to come to a position. I would genuinely urge Sinn Féin members, having travelled this far, come a little further. Let them now support our motion and exclude the First Minister until a full investigation takes place. In doing so, let them follow the advice of someone they might respect who spoke not so long ago on a similar scandal. He said, people have seen through this because citizens are not stupid. They have seen through the patronising responses and insulting remarks. The actions of this government in this, cha in this chamber in failing to be straight with the opposition or with the citizens is damaging faith in the political system. He goes on to say that a credible government cannot continue to evade questions and duck and dodge the responsibilities. 
They merely expose this government's arrogance and incompetence. Those are the words of Mr. Gerry Adams supporting a motion of no confidence in the Dáil in 2014. They would, do, they would be wise to avoid a partition in their principles. Mr. Speaker, 2016 has been a strange and a serious year for politics. Even those who only tune in occasionally to current affairs will have noticed a change in, fr in its frequency and its tone. If 2016 was a bad year for losing musical greats, it's been an even worse year for politics. Too often in the last year, public service has been opportunistically downgraded and demeaned in the minds of the public. As we begin to face into 2017, let us begin to change that narrative. First Minister, redeem some faith that public service is beyond the selfish needs of any one individual. Redeem some faith in these institutions and restore some dignity in your office and in our politics. Think beyond yourself and beyond your party. First Minister, step aside now. I propose this motion. I call the First Minister, Ms. Arlene Foster. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's good to see people back in their place, um, which, of course, will not deal with the facts of the RHI scheme, but with uh, a totally doomed motion. Uh, doomed because of what uh, votes they need. And I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to say that I serve this country as First Minister, not at the pleasure of my political opponents, but because of the mandate of the people of Northern Ireland in an election less than eight months ago. I'm delighted to say that in this country, at least, it is still the people and not the politicians who get to decide who should be in office. And it's certainly not the responsibility of those politicians who were soundly rejected at the polls such a short time ago to decide who should hold the highest ministerial office, however much they may wish to do so. Mr Speaker, the RHI debacle deserves to be fully investigated and understood, and that is what will happen. We need to know exactly what went wrong and how we're going to fix it. <coughs> what does not serve the people of Northern Ireland well are those who seek to play cheap political points. I know Christmas is coming, but the attempt to turn this issue into a political pantomime is a diversion and a distraction from the important work that is going on. This motion turns what has been a very serious issue into low farce. It's a kamikaze motion with no prospect of success, and its proposers know that. It will not shine any light on the truth, nor does it seek to find solutions. Instead, it will cruelly expose the impotence of those parties who shirk their responsibilities rather than face up to the difficult choices that a government faces. It exposes and confirms what has already been clear over these last few weeks, that this is nothing short of an attempt at a constitutional coup d'etat, but I have to say it's a coup d'etat more worthy of a carry-on film. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I know that if the election had been held just amongst newspaper pundits and elements in the BBC, this party would not be where it is today. If they had their way, a few of us would be scattered across the back benches, probably sitting where Mr Alistair and Mr Agnew are today, though perhaps with a few more seats. But it's the people and not the media who decide. The people and not the media who decide. What people want is to get the problem sorted, not yet more arguing and bickering and stunts of walking out when they could have heard the fact from politicians here at Stormont. They want to know what our priority is to reduce projected costs, not claw back, but to reduce projected costs, not to claim a political scalp. And that's what this is all about, trying to claim a political scalp. I'm here. I will be staying here to fulfil the trust that has been placed in me and to make sure that this whole mess has been cleared up. And that's what my priority is in all of this. I deeply regret the fact that the scheme was flawed from the outset. I regret the fact that it has placed a projected burden on our public finances that we are now seeking to bring under control. But I totally and absolutely reject any notion that I have ever done anything other than act with the highest levels of integrity from the start of this process. Mr Speaker, as should be the process, I have made a statement to this chamber and laid down the facts of this scheme. My opponents were so interested, they walked out. So confident were they in their arguments that they couldn't be bothered attending the debate or to ask me a question, just one question on the record. 
They're very brave in front of a camera, but cowards in this chamber. And this is because this is because they're not interested in a discussion. They're not interested in a discussion, let alone a debate. All they're interested in is political distraction, a political distraction. And you know why they want a distraction. You know why they're desperate for a political distraction, because they've no purpose. They've no plan. They've no policies for Northern Ireland. Unlike the DUP, who have a plan to create more jobs by bringing in more business investment. Unlike the DUP, who have a plan for ensuring we get the best deal for Northern Ireland. Unlike the DUP, they have no plan to strengthen our schools and strengthen our hospitals. Well, we do, and we're not going to be distracted by these games. Mr Speaker, my political life is about bringing people together, and I'm proud to say I've done it again today, getting the UUP, SDLP and Sinn Féin to work together. It shows what they can achieve when they put their selfish interest first. Imagine what could be achieved if they put the people of Northern Ireland first. Imagine what this chamber could achieve if they harnessed this energy and made the people of Northern Ireland their priority instead of themselves. I will always put the people of Northern Ireland first, and I am proud to do so. What I do want to do this afternoon, however, is to analyse the motion that is before us, to consider the statutory provisions on which it is based, respond to the central allegations, consider the role of the media in all of this, and finally, to make it clear that this party will use the mandate of last May to defeat this motion. Mr Speaker, this motion today is, of course, premature, it's inappropriate, and it has no evidence to justify it. Above all else, the one aspect of this motion that most cruelly exposes the motivation of those who have sought it is the timing. No one could possibly conclude that all the evidence has been weighed and considered and that action should follow. What we have here is trial by television, not by the appropriate authorities. What we have here are facts being disregarded in a fevered quest to build my political gallows. What we have here is nothing more than shameful political opportunism. The central charges against me in this debate today haven't even been considered by the PAC or any independent investigation for that matter, let alone decided upon. This rush to judgment not only exposes the political motivations of my opponents, it raises serious questions about the fitness of those who sit on the PAC to be impartial. This debate is a fact-free zone. No evidence, no adverse findings, nothing that could even resemble a basis for the motion being tabled, never mind passed. Now, until very recently, there were constant calls from across the political spectrum for me to give evidence to the PAC. It almost seemed like every news outlet, every bulletin, every press release featured that demand. I wouldn't be surprised if Donald Trump even tweeted it. Well, guess what? I'm ready and willing to go to the PAC. I've made that very clear. But suddenly, by magic, that's not good enough for Mike, Colm and Naomi. They want me out before I get near the PAC, before I get asked a single question or even open my mouth. So much for due process, so much for justice, so much for the facts. I ask this question in all sincerity of those who table this motion today. Would you tolerate for one second action being taken against a constituent on the basis of utterly unsubstantiated allegations? I sincerely hope you wouldn't, and I expect your constitu constituents wouldn't feel the same. There are basic rules in the Assembly that my critics are trying to flout. Rules at the heart of power sharing. MLAs designated as nationalists or others can't gang up and kick out the elected leader of unionism. Those rules work the other way too. How many sermons on power sharing have we heard over the years from the SDLP and the Ulster Unionist Party? And yet, here they are trying to bring back majority rule. I'm sure Mrs Long will get her chance to speak, as she always does. Perhaps none of this should come as a surprise. Perhaps none of this should come as a surprise. When I look around the chamber at those who have supported this motion, all I can see is individuals hungry for publicity and profile, jockeying for position as they desperately seek the media spotlight. I see Mr Eastwood and his party searching for political relevance after losing more seats at the election and opting out of government. I see Mr Nesbitt, the man who led the Ulster Unionist Party to its worst result in over 100 years, fighting for revenge against the party that humiliated him and defied his predictions at the polls. 
But no matter what Mr Nesbitt says, let me say one thing. I won't be asking for him to step aside as leader of the Ulster Unionist Party. Both, both the SDLP and Ulster Unionist Party chose to go into opposition. That's entirely a matter for them. I don't take any objection to it. I'm just grateful they aren't very good at it. And then, of course, there's Naomi Long of the Alliance Party. I have to say that in the past, for the most part, the Alliance Party behaved in a more considered and responsible way than this, but of course, that was under a different leader. No doubt, at some point, we'll hear today that uh, this decision is related to the flags protest. No, I will not, or for costing her party. Uh, a place in the executive last May. And then, of course, there's Mr. Alistair. Well, in fairness to Mr. Alistair, there's never yet been an exclusion motion that he hasn't been prepared to sign, so we can let him off this time. So let me turn to the detail of the motion before the House. It's an exclusion motion in accordance with Section 30 of the Northern Ireland Act. This is the most severe power for dealing with political parties or ministers on the statute book. Section 30 of the Northern Ireland Act was originally introduced as a way of dealing with those who were linked to ongoing paramilitary and criminal activity after the Belfast Agreement, but were otherwise legally entitled to a place in government. Indeed, in 2003, this provision was bolstered by a power for the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland to exclude following a report from the IMC. This provision has never been regarded as a substitute for the normal accountability arrangements of ministers to the electorate or to this assembly. It was intended as a long stop when the normal processes did not or could not work. At Westminster, where the House of Commons passes a vote of no confidence in the government, the convention is that it will precipitate a general election. Where the House loses confidence in a minister, the expectation is that the minister will resign. Nowhere are there powers of exclusion contained within the Northern Ireland Act for the very reason that the Northern Ireland powers were drafted to deal with the particular circumstances of the links between political parties and the paramilitary groups at the time of the Belfast Agreement. Members on this side of the House will recall that when the Ulster Unionist Party and the SCLP had the power to exclude Sinn Féin when IRA activity continued in the first term of the Assembly, they sat on their hands and did nothing. On any proper analysis, Section 30 is only appropriate either where there is a proven link to paramilitary or criminal activity or for the most uh, wrongdoing of a, on the part of ministers and where the normal democratic processes do not suffice. It is not for MLAs to arrogate to themselves the role of appeal chamber to decisions of the electorate. Absent some allegation of corruption, fraud or criminal activity, even the outrageous and outlandish allegations of the opposition fall far short of what would justify a proper use of Section 30. So even the use of Section 30 represents a massive overreach by those who have tabled it before the House today. The fact that it is tabled before the PAC or any other body has investigated the matter, never mind reached any conclusions or recommendations, make it an even more inappropriate device for this debate today. Section 30 was not drafted for these circumstances, but the real truth for the proposers of the motion is that this is a motion designed to fail. Mr Speaker, let me turn now to the charges that have been made in this debate and in the motion on the order paper. The allegation is that I fail to observe the highest standards of propriety and regularity in relation to the stewardship of public funds surrounding the RHI scheme. One can only assume that this relates to the period when I was minister responsible for the RHI scheme and not some guilt by association with what happened when I left the department. We should be absolutely clear that the charge that has been made is not that I made some error of judgment in relation to the policy. The charge that has been made here today is that I did not observe the highest standards of propriety and regularity. This is a serious, a remarkably serious and grave allegation to make. It is one which implies not merely an error of judgment, but some malign intent or involvement. And of course, there is not a scintilla of evidence to justify such a charge. This claim goes far beyond even any allegations made by the BBC, or even Mr Bell for that matter, of my conduct as Minister for the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. When it is published in full, the record will show that at all points, I followed the professional advice of the officials, the experts and the consultants. I approved the recommendations that were made to me. No, I referred the correspondence of the concerned citizen to my departmental officials. At no point was any recommendation made to me to introduce cost control measures. In fact, far from it. 
I was being told that we needed to increase, not decrease, the take-up of the scheme. Although the opposition do not want to hear it, and clearly didn't want to hear it, or they would have been in the chamber earlier on, the simple fact remains that at no time during my tenure in the department was I warned that there could be an overspend. As minister, I, of course, accept responsibility for the work of the department, but the charge that I did not observe the highest standards of probity and regularity is completely and totally baseless. If I am to be blamed for anything, it is in accepting the professional advice that I was offered. However, in this regard, I am not alone. I did not introduce this scheme as a unilateral ministerial decision. I brought proposals for this scheme to the Enterprise Trade and Investment Committee to be considered and scrutinised. They did not simply nod through the regulations, but as the Chairman, Mr. Patsy McGlone, told us, and it bears repeating, quote, the committee's scrutiny of the development of the renewable heat incentive has been considerable and reflects the importance and long-term nature of the proposals. Before supporting the RHI, the committee sought and received assurances on incentive and tariff levels, banding levels, incentives for domestic con consumers, payments to participants and support levels for the renewable heat premium payment scheme. In fact, as it was recorded at the time, the introduction of the regulations was delayed because the committee took so long to scrutinise the scheme. And lest anyone thinks that concerns were raised that the tariff was too high, exactly, exactly the opposite was the case, as was so eloquently highlighted by Mr. McGlone, who said, quote, some concerns have been expressed that the tariffs for the renewable heat incentive are lower than those in Britain because the tariff is generated against a counterfactual position of heating oil. If there were errors on my part, they were errors that were specifically endorsed by the committee after, and I quote, considerable scrutiny. Indeed, not only did the committee consider and approve this scheme, but so too did the entire assembly. In fact, one of the other signatories of today's motion, Mrs. Overend, gave her specific support to the scheme and said, quote, having had the opportunity to scrutinize the regulations in committee, I am happy to support the minister in bringing them forward, end quote. So she too accepts that she had scrutinized the regulations with continued the vital flaw, which contained the vital flaw in the scheme. But she also went on to address the issue as to why we opted for a Northern Ireland specific scheme and not the GB scheme. She said, given that there are differences between renewable heat markets in Great Britain and Northern Ireland, it was important that DETI undertook its own research and economic appraisal of the situation here. That research, followed by a public consultation, has undoubtedly been invaluable in informing decision makers on the best way forward for a renewable heat incentive scheme for Northern Ireland. Now, in fairness to Mrs. Overend and Mr. McGlone, they were not alone. Everyone who spoke in the debate supported the regulations. There was not a single voice in opposition. So today, this motion is seeking to exclude me from office for a policy and a scheme which received not just committee support, but unanimous support of this Assembly. This morning, I dealt with the issue of the concerned citizen. I don't intend to repeat it today, but I followed the appropriate steps in passing it to officials. So in short, the motion today seeks to cascade me for a scheme which was not just based on following the advice of officials, but one which received the unanimous support of the committee after detailed scrutiny and the endorsement of the Assembly. As I said before, it amounts to nothing more than a carry-on coup d'etat. Mr Speaker, none of the other allegations that have been made in recent days relate to my period as Deputy Minister and are not particularly germane today, but I want to reiterate the fact that I had no role whatsoever in the decision of the Deputy Minister to introduce cost controls to the scheme in 2015. My involvement in 2016 and that of the Deputy First Minister was to bring forward the closure of the scheme and not to delay it. The publication by the Department of the Economy of the note for the record of the allegations concerning claims made around the deleting of government records also speaks for itself. Mr Speaker, I am grateful for the opportunity to respond to this motion today. For almost two weeks, I have listened on a daily basis to lies presented as facts, the truth distorted out of all recognition, and a public narrative created and relentlessly pursued which bears no relationship to reality. Now, I'm not surprised that the opposition, in their desperation, would seek to exploit for cynical political reasons a situation, but I would expect better, I do expect better, from publicly funded broadcasters, 
when they fail to present the facts in a fair and impartial way. That, unfortunately, has not been the case. From the start of this process, I have not sought to hide from my responsibilities, this House, or even the media. I have been out and about fulfilling my engagements, during which I have met people from all walks of life who have offered me warm words of encouragement and support. I made a full and detailed statement this morning. I gave a lengthy interview to the BBC last week. And here I am this afternoon responding to this debate. Mr Speaker, this does not elevate our political process. It does nothing to solve the many problems and challenges that we face. It reduces our politics to a soap opera and the conduct of this House to little better than a television drama. Oh, not a very believable one at that. Our people deserve better. Last May, I asked the people of Northern Ireland for a mandate. I got it. I don't intend to run away from my responsibilities, and after this speech, I have further meetings about how we find solutions, whilst others will talk to a meaningless motion in this House, and no doubt will get coverage on the news tonight, and I hope they enjoy it. I hope they enjoy it, because you know what? Their credibility isn't going to be helped one iota by what goes on here today. However, we got into this position, I will make sure that we will put it right. It's time for solutions not the nonsense that we're about to hear from the oppositions. And as I said this morning, we will implement a plan, we will get the costs down, we will have a full independent... If you'd have been here this morning, you would have heard it. Yeah. Uh, we will have a... Order, members. Order. Order. We, not for the first time. Uh, we will get the cost down, we will have a full independent investigation as to where all of this went wrong. And today, using the mandate we earned last May, we will defeat this motion. Mr Speaker, let me conclude today by saying I remain as committed today as I did on the day I was elected as First Minister to fight the good fight, finish the race and keep the faith. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, when an exclusion motion is put before the House and a vote of no confidence is put forward, it is essentially a debate about leadership. Now, to my mind, in terms of providing that leadership, it is not about having a perfect society in which problems don't arise, mistakes aren't made. The test of true leadership is actually in dealing with those problems, in facing up to the responsibilities whenever those problems arise and in finding solutions to those problems. And so we were given today uh, two different routes in terms of the assembly that it could take. There were two pieces of business on the order paper today. The first came from the First Minister. It detailed in terms of a statement, in terms of detailed facts, how we got here in terms of the RHI issue. It outlined a support for a fully independent uh, inquiry and indeed, let me make this clear in case there's any degree of confusion. That is not a DUP inquiry. It is not a Sinn Féin inquiry. It is an entirely independent inquiry that we would support, uh, which would bring its, its own verdict uh, on the events uh, so far. And most importantly, because I think that what the electorate out there is looking at is seeing the potential uh, for cost as we move ahead, what actually is going to get taken in terms of reducing that cost and removing the burden from future taxpayers. And we saw the first steps. No, the member, the member will have his chance, and indeed, the member had the chance to actually question the First Minister earlier on, but abrogated that responsibility. Can I say, the First Minister took the responsible leadership role today by outlining that, because what people want to see is a process in which those costs are reduced and they are not future burdened. By contrast, the position taken by the opposition parties was a politically motivated stunt, one which is targeted at an individual, one which offers no solutions as to how we move forward, or indeed even referenced uh, an inquiry. Now, what we've seen over the last couple of weeks from the opposition is a, an opportunistic and cynically, cynically driven uh, approach to this issue. We've heard numerous members of the opposition on, first of all, writing off the 400 million as if it's already been spent, and indeed, dealing with the issue with a level of glee that they would actually hope that this was a much greater figure. 
because it would, it would cause greater uh, degrees of political di uh, difficulties. We have seen one that is entirely in the basking of hindsight because it has been highlighted throughout all the consultations, throughout all the debates in this assembly, throughout all the committee structures, there wasn't a single voice that came from the main opposition parties to say, hold on a moment, this has been got wrong, we need to put a cap on this, we need to bring this, this to a, a swifter conclusion. Quite the contrary, there's a range of statements that indeed whenever this uh, RHI was brought to a close earlier on this year, the opposition parties trooped in one by one to oppose it, complaining about the impact that the closure of this would have on jobs, the closure it would have on the local economy. They didn't want to close this, they wanted it extended. You know, and at the heart of this is the issue of the election. We were told, we've been told recently, vote Mike, get column. Or get column, get Mike. Well, let me make it very clear. People Order have the opportunity members. in that. Members. Order. Yeah, I mean, it shows, it shows the kind of mature attitude that's been taken in relation to this. I have to say, people had the opportunity this year to vote Mike and get column, or vote column and get Mike. Possibly the most unattractive two-for-one offer that's ever been made in the history of marketing. And they said no. They want to back that. Now, I give at least the leader of the STLP some degree of praise uh, for what he has done in terms of this, this issue. He has at least moved on. Some time ago, he was carrying uh, the coffin of a dissident terrorist. Yeah. He's now moved on to carrying the Ulster Unionist Party on his back, yeah. who, have, who have trooped in loyally behind him. Yeah. You know, Mr. Speaker, we're not going to have trial by television and radio. We're not going to have trial by innuendo and smear, trial by revenge, trial by jealousy. And I have to say, in terms of prejudging the issues, there will be members of the Public Accounts Committee who are supposed to give an objective view on this, who will be tripping, already deciding that they have given uh, their view in terms of the uh, objectivity of this and produced a verdict before it is reached within that. Now, let me make it clear, finally, in terms of Arlene Foster. I've known Arlene Foster since she was 18. I, I'm probably the person in the chamber who's That's actually known her the, the longest period of time. Uh, she is a person of integrity, ability and conviction, and she will carry on. She will lead for unionism in Northern Ireland. She's not a might come lately in relation to this debate. And she will lead. Yes, happy to give way. Happy to give the member an extra minute. <laughs> will, the, will, the, will the member please continue? Well, in terms of, in terms of the, the issue, yes. It is the case that in terms of... Member's time is up. Okay. I urge people to then reject the motion that is before us and actually deal with the issues. Members. Border, Mr. Alistair. Is it not the rule of this House that any intervention after the five-minute the five period is now and void? Your, your, your comments are recorded, Mr. Alistair. I call Mr. Connor Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I suppose it's slightly embarrassing that we have this unedifying shambles uh, taking place. Not just the revelations around the scheme, which was very badly conceived, uh, very, very badly handled, and which is costing a substantial amount to the public purse, uh, unless a, a good scheme can be put together to try and reduce that, but it already has cost a substantial amount to the public purse. That's then compounded by the prospect or the, the, uh, the, the actuality of, of the uh, television programme where we have the First Minister and a former senior minister uh, in her executive hurling ac accusations at each other, revelations and, and accusations around uh, special advisers and the role they played in relation to this scheme. We've then gone on uh, to last night where there have been selective releasing of papers from the Department of the Economy by the Minister involving civil servants in an internal squabble within the DUP as to who was right and who was wrong. Uh, issues which are now being refuted by the former Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment. And we have had the, this morning's behaviour then, where the joint nature of the office of the First and Deputy First Minister uh, has been challenged, and the Speaker himself, in, order to, in terms of trying to uh, allow business to go ahead, having his office uh, significantly challenged this morning. All of this has been a very unedifying spectacle, which has added to public disquiet about the entire handling of this uh, scheme and the revelations and the allegations around it. And I have to say to the party opposite, uh, as they continue that, they may well circle the wagons and think that's the best method of defence, but when you're in a hole, you need to stop digging. The, 
none of this, the circling of the wagons and the robust defence, is actually answering the questions that the public uh, want answered. It's not dealing with the broad range of issues that the public want to see answered. And neither does the motion in front of us. By the admission of the mover of the motion, this is about the career of one individual. And I quote him, I think, correctly when I say that. This is about the career of one individual. If only this was about the career of one individual, then perhaps it would be much easier dealt with. But the reality is this is about much more than the career of one individual. This motion doesn't deal with the investigation that's required. It doesn't analyse the role of civil servants in relation to this. It doesn't deal with the former minister, Jonathan Bell, and the allegations that he'd make. It doesn't deal with the, the role of the first minister in relation to that and the special advisers who have been alleged to have been improperly involved in extending the length of the scheme when it was advised to be closed down. And nor does it deal, uh, as quite rightly was put by the proposer of the motion, with the applicants and the need to understand who benefited from this scheme, because I think that will also cast some answers in relation to the operation of the scheme itself. Uh, and so what we do need is a proposition to this assembly that does deal with all of those things. That isn't about a short-term fix or a, a quick headbutt to somebody and then walk out uh, and, and uh, say, you know, we've done our job. But what actually deals with these issues and also deals with a very necessary proposition, robust proposition, to put a scheme in place which actually undoes the financial catastrophe that this scheme uh, has, has managed to foist on our uh, public funding. This proposition doesn't do anything for that. And we did ask the proposers of this motion and those involved in SECNET to put it to one side and to join us in the motion that we have submitted for the new year, which does in fact deal with all of these issues, which isn't just about the career of one individual, but actually deals with the entirety of what needs to be examined here and the fact that we need to get to the bottom of all this. It seems, unfortunately, that the day in the sun, in the spotlight, is more important than actually getting to the heart of these issues. But no, we will return. I very happily give way. Does the member accept that perhaps the motion in front of him today, which I would ask him to speak to, is the first step in looking at where did that £400 million go? Where is it agreed to go? What are the principles here? The public are angry, the pu and the tone of this debate is not fitting of what the public mood is rightly angry, and the debate so far is a disgrace to this House, an absolute disgrace. The mem member has an extra minute. Uh, well, in fairness to, to answer the member, uh, it isn't the first step, it's actually the last step. And what the public mood want to see is a proper investigation into this entirety of this issue, not the career of one individual, uh, a, a proper investigation into the entirety of this. The motion doesn't deal at all with investigation. It doesn't deal with financial recovery. It deals, doesn't deal with the broad range of people who have been mentioned in this, including the First Minister and her role, including the former Deputy Minister, including the DUP Special Advisors, including civil servants. It doesn't deal with any of that. And I, I will uh, briefly... Thank, thank the member very much for giving me. The member and his party had every opportunity to put down an amendment yeah. uh, to this motion. Yeah, yeah. You put one down that couldn't possibly be accepted. So who's playing stunt politics? There was an opportunity to put all those things into the motion, but you, you missed your opportunity. It's very interesting that this morning uh, the member and his colleagues in the opposition spent the full morning challenging the authority of the Speaker in relation to this, but when he refuses an amendment from my party, it's entirely correct. Uh, so you can't have your, ha can't have your cake and eat it. The motion, the, motion does not, the motion does not get to the heart of what we are trying to do. It is simply about an opportunity to grandstand in the chamber. What this, what this institution needs and what people are asking for is a proper, fully-fledged... Member uh, concludes his remarks. ...is a proper, fully-fledged resolution. The First Minister should step aside until that is concluded. And there is also a need for a, an, urgent scheme, an urgent scheme to get uh, the finances and issues issue resolved and recovered. I call Mr Steve Aiken. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I, along with my party, uh, will be on rise to talk about this motion, and it's important that we listen, listen, that we listen to the angry and increasingly frustrated voices of our constituents, many of whom have expressed directly their incomp incomprehension on how the scheme, available to just 5,000 recipients, giving them a potential tax-free payout of around £275,000 could have happened. 
notwithstanding the fact that it is costing us over £85,000 a day and every day until this is sorted out. However, I must express a much wider concern, a malaise about our government that has a disregard for the people of Northern Ireland, but is focused on the retention of power for the sake of power itself. It is a government that holds the process of good order, responsibility and accountability in contempt. Whether it is the economy minister obfuscating about US airline routes, the agriculture minister denying that she has discussions with waste incinerators followed by 60 seconds later quoting from the same letter here in this house. The communities minister telling councils to prepare to revive regeneration powers then remaining the same. And the abject failure to address the existential challenge to Northern Ireland from Brexit. The arrogance of power with little or no accountability is beyond breathtaking. It is approaching institutionalised corruption. To add to that, we have a prison system that is in meltdown, with suicide rates running at nearly one a week. We have an, an executive that seems to believe it is perfectly all right for paramilitaries to lead social enterprises, even when the chief constable categorically makes clear that illegal activity is being perpetrated by members of that organisation. An organisation whose accounts have to be qualified because the files caught fire. It seems the incineration of combustible material will be a metaphor for our hopefully short leader of the DUP's term in office, whose epitaph will be less leading Northern Ireland into its second century, but why they'll be remembered for helping to keep Ferraris warm. And this is just since July. But to the question on standing aside, we need to refer in greater detail to the period when the DUP leader was Deputy Minister. Indeed, until recently, she and her party were at pains to explain that our wealth of experience as Northern Ireland's longest serving minister made her ideally suited for this highest office. Yet, using her own language, she then explained she was not over the detail, and neither were any of the copious numbers of SPADs, more than I might add Scotland and Wales combined, on one of the most potentially expensive energy schemes anywhere. To go back, ministers do policy. And when that policy goes wrong, in normal governments, they do the decent thing or are sacked. The SPADs are sacked, and under normal rules, the ex-minister, SPADs and culpable civil servants are banned from employment in the sector that their minister covered for several years, but not here. Any mapping out of the golden circle here will see the same names that were connected to ministers and parties regularly appearing on quangos, often receiving up to 22 grand a year for their trouble. Little wonder a very senior US official compared Northern Ireland to the former East Germany, but with better golf clubs. We need to go back to 2012 when our then minister decided on a renewable policy for Northern Ireland. Remarkably so when many of our own party even denied that climate change is happening. There was even a very clear model and one that the United Kingdom would large, largely pay for and had safeguards and a regulator attached who would ensure its smooth running. It gave incentive to industry, supported reducing green, and supported reducing greenhouse emissions. So why then did Detty, or more appositely, the leader of the DUP, decide not to follow it? Or did she have some form of intuitive insight that the rest of the UK renewable sector didn't have, although somehow the GB scheme has managed to remain largely on budget and delivery? It is also noteworthy that in GB they are not commissioning renewable energy at twice the capacity of the grid to support it, or charging small-scale producers three times the going rate for connection charges. Again, all perverse policy decisions that deserve answers. So why then do we have a failure of energy policy? Real concerns over brownouts are worse and some of the highest energy I'm costs in Europe. There are policy decisions made directly by the leader. Yet there is no minister who is responsible it was all the officials' fault. Yes. May a lot of this is about judgment, and that's the big question mark about the actions of the minister. The member has an extra minute. Um, quite frankly, it makes little or no sense about what's going on here. When we've had Ofgem, we've made clear that they were in regular, regular contact with Detty, pointing out their concerns. And I think, like many people, we find it inconceivable that the civil servants did not keep in regular contact with DEC going forward. And while I may have little sympathy for Jonathan Bell in many things, he was clearly handled a 1.18 billion hospital pass if ever there was one. Yet, 
There is no minister who is responsible. It is all of the officials' fault. It was somebody else. It was the previous minister. But the responsibility, the accountability, and need to atone for this disaster lies with only one person. The so-called leader of our country has shown neither the leadership, gravitas, or humility to be our first minister. For all those reasons stated above, she must Members stand up now. Yeah. Yeah. Call Ms. Naomi Law. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 2016 has not been a good year in politics generally, um, and it has been a particularly bad year for these institutions. It has been marked by allegations of corruption, cronyism and incompetence, of cock-up and cover-up. Mr Speaker, it is clear that despite all of the DUP's bluff and bluster in an attempt to distract the public, the core questions around the RHI scheme remain unanswered. Why was the scheme changed to remove the cost control measures that existed in the GB scheme? Why was the opportunity to close that loophole and correct the scheme not grasped at the earliest possible opportunity? Who knew of all of this and at what stage? And crucially, who stood to benefit from the lack of cost control and the delay in addressing that when it was drawn to their attention? So far, despite the many statements emanating from the DUP, indeed because of them, the only thing of which we can be sure is that we have not heard the truth, the whole truth. Instead, we have heard anything but the truth. We now need an independent judge-led inquiry to forensically examine those issues, all of the paperwork, emails, memos between those involved, special advisers, those who benefited from the scheme, ministers um, and, and everyone else, including their civil servants. Mr Speaker, the First Minister has spoken quite rightly of due process, but there is a precedent in this place. The First Minister was called on today to voluntarily step down and allow an investigation to take place without prejudice. I said that last week and I say it again now, to put the integrity of office against the interests of her party. She still has time to do so. The previous First Minister stood aside in order to allow investigation into a £50 million land deal. £50,000 pound land deal pales into insignificance in comparison to what we are dealing with here. Would the member give way? I will. And just further to that, would the member agree with me that in doing so, it should not be taken as an admission of wrongdoing, but rather a reflection that this issue is to be addressed and issues of confidence to be restored? Absolutely. The member has an extra minute. Absolutely, I would agree, which is why I said without prejudice to the outcome. However, the First Minister initially blamed her officials, officials behind whom she is now seeking shelter. The DUP said neither of their ministers had any responsibility for these issues, and so it stood right up until Jonathan Bell broke ranks. Suddenly, the DUP were openly willing to say that the errors they previously denied were entirely his fault. We have had whistleblowers acknowledged, then denied, then exposed to the public, and now acknowledged again. And yet we still get lectures from the First Minister on clarity, truth and confidence. It is an, an issue of confidence that goes to the heart of this. Even in the manner in which the First Minister handled the fiasco of a statement this morning, failing to get the confidence and support of the Deputy First Minister, and then continuing with it in the absence of that support, undermining the very devolution settlement on which her office relies, confidence in the First Minister has continued to be undermined. This is not about any individual, it is about these institutions and it is about the anger, weariness and disgust which the public feel towards them at this point in time. Stepping down at this stage voluntarily and without prejudice would be preferable, but it has been ruled out by the First Minister and her colleagues. That is why my colleagues and I are supporting this motion. And if in the new year Sinn Féin put a competent motion to effect an independent judge-led inquiry, we will support that too. Finally, we don't come here to support this lightly. We committed when we went into opposition that we would be a constructive opposition, that we would support government where we believed that it was acting in the best interest of the people of Northern Ireland. Well, today it is not acting in the best interest of the people of Northern Ireland. It is failing them massively. And we, I would call again on the First Minister, put the people of Northern Ireland first, as you have said you will do, even at this late stage. 
voluntarily step down from your role, allow your colleague to step in and cover for you as you did for the previous First Minister, initiate a judge-led inquiry, independent under the Inquiries Act, in order that the truth can be told, because no one should fear the truth unless they are hiding it now. If people are being fully honest, then they have nothing to fear. And I would call on her at this stage because I believe that that is the intention of this motion, to get to the truth of this situation, not to satisfy me, not to satisfy this chamber, but to satisfy the people of Northern Ireland whose money has been squandered in this debacle. Yeah. Call Mr Paul Gibbon. Speaker, uh, the public are rightly concerned about what has happened in the design of this scheme. It is rightly concerned about the abuse that has taken place uh, in terms of this scheme and, and those that have been using and how they've benefited from it. They're rightly concerned that they committed spend uh, as a result of this scheme, and they rightly want people to be held to account. All sentiments, which if members had been in the chamber, would have heard the First Minister articulate in her statement. Uh, and outlining how we need to get uh, to the truth in all of this. So what this statement doesn't, uh, what this motion doesn't have, however, is the process in which to seek that. What this motion is about is one individual. It's not about the institutions. It's not about the executive. Um, because if it was, it would have been a motion around the scheme and all of those areas uh, that have been highlighted. I'll happily give way, yes. Perhaps the Minister could uh, tell us how, how many social houses it would build, the £400 million black hole that we're going to have for this scheme would build for those languishing on the social housing waiting list? Well, the member has an extra minute. I appreciate the, the member's uh, additional minute, but what the contribution does highlight, however, is that this motion is to be used in respect of a whole range of other issues as opposed to dealing with the substance of this issue, and it's about undermining Arlene Foster, and that's what the purposes of this motion is about. Now, if I was an Ulster Unionist, I can understand why you want to undermine Arlene Foster. We only need to go back to the election, uh, and Mr Nesbitt, if he has his letter with him, can reopen it and have a look at how many seats he was predicting. So we know why the Ulster Unionists want to undermine Arlene Foster. We know why the SDLP are seeking to outflank uh, Sinn Féin, uh, out, out, outflank Sinn Féin in respect of this issue. And what I would say to Sinn Féin is, don't be spooked by what the SDLP is doing and people before profit. And I understand they're, they're, challenging, they're challenging within that constituency, but let's focus on tackling the key issues around this scheme and having a process in place that will get to the truth of the matter. So this motion uh, brought forward by the SDLP has been seen for what it is. Uh, it's nothing but political opportunism. From the party that once was the party of civil rights, who believed in innocent unless proven guilty, uh, who believed in due process, now set that all aside. This motion is about passing the sentence, uh, never mind the verdict, uh, and then let's see if we can get the evidence uh, to fit into the verdict that they now want to cast in the Assembly. And that shows where the SDLP have now moved from the party of civil rights. Not surprising. Uh, that they have uh, departed from that. And whenever uh, Mr Eastwood was being put right by the First Minister around, or, or, in respect of, uh, or Mr uh, Weir in respect of the coffin that he carried, doesn't like to be reminded of that. And doesn't like to be reminded of it because it's the truth. Members can point out uh, all of the uh, political opportunism that they have with the First Minister. There is nothing to hide on these benches, but whenever the truth is pointed to the SDLP and the hypocrisy that they have had over many years, they don't like it because it's the truth. Then we have the media and the narrative that the media have been pursuing. Ms. Foster, Mrs Foster referred to the, the publicly funded broadcaster, let's name it as the BBC, and the way in which they have conducted uh, themselves as an organisation is in stark contrast to some other uh, media outlets. Again, it's about presenting uh, allegations as fact. Again, it's been around using... Again, it's been about... Point of order. Could the, could, would it be possible for you to give a ruling? The Minister uh, for Communities is currently speaking, I believe, as a backbench member of the DUP, but he does have responsibility for public broadcasting in Northern Ireland and is making serious allegations against a public broadcaster. Is that in order? Yeah. Yeah. Well, 
the member has the opportunity to put her point on record. And I, the member was called as an individual member, not as a minister. And again, they use pejorative language in their interviews, uh, presenting facts, uh, presenting allegations as facts. And there has clearly been a pursuit of Arlene Foster as the individual. The entirety of this case has been personalised. It has been in the absence uh, in respect to the broader issues around uh, how these uh, submissions were never brought, it was never highlighted in terms of failures in the parts of civil servants, in terms of identifying these issues. And I, like the public, am alarmed whenever civil servants have gave evidence to the PAC that it was only after this event, through a secret shopper, that we get to the truth. I share the anger that the public have around all of this, but whenever it's being presented by the BBC, whenever it's been presented by the opposition, it's all been personalised in order to pursue uh, the First Minister. And just to, to remind uh, Naomi Long, whenever she was speaking earlier, Again, it highlights how other members, whenever this was dealt with in the chamber, dealt with by Patsy McGlone when he was chairman of the committee, and all members of the House, the way in which they dealt with these things, Trevor Lund, whenever he dealt with the issue, uh, in terms of the closure, whenever the then minister wanted it to, we now know at the end of March, and then obviously it had to be uh, within two weeks. Trevor Lund, who I have a lot of respect for, uh, he said, it is good news because um, it is an excellent scheme. A lot of people have already benefited from it, and a few more may do so before the thing closes. So members in the opposition were saying then that this was an excellent scheme, but clearly the evidence is now showing that that hasn't been the case, and hindsight is a wonderful thing. So let's be clear, there isn't going to be uh, the resignation of the First Minister. There isn't going to be the stepping aside by the First Minister. This party uh, even if the First Minister wanted to, wouldn't allow her to, but she doesn't, because the First Minister has led this executive for the past six months. We have been delivering on a whole range of issues. The opposition have wanted now to try and diminish that, and they use this as a smokescreen in terms of trying uh, to dilute all of this. But we will continue to remain focused on what we need to achieve, uh, and that is continuing over the period of this mandate, addressing the key issues that need uh, to be tackled. Uh, so let's focus on what's important. Let's get to the core root of the issues around this scheme about tackling the committed uh, expenditure that is there, because that's ultimately what the public want. The public will not uh, want to see the pantomime that has went on this morning in terms of the walkout when members could have held the First Minister to account but chose not to do so. They will want us to get to grips with this issue. And it is with regret that I watched Jonathan Bell's performance uh, whenever he gave evidence. And the public, I think, will make judgment in due course in terms of uh, what was said during that. And I know, as a believer, as someone who's a Christian, Jonathan can reflect on his conduct in terms of that. But I would point him to Luke chapter 18 and the parable that the Lord brought in terms of the publican and the Pharisee. And members who are and familiar with that parable will be able to draw a parallel. To the debate. So I would ask that members don't uh, make responses in relation to the executive. Michelle O'Neill, I call Michelle O'Neill. Corlia, and I think that the benches opposite are absolutely misreading the public uh, perception. I think that we've spent the last good part of the last number of hours since the chamber business started today with antics, with shambolic actions with statements being made without the authority of the entire executive office. I don't think that's good enough. I'm actually embarrassed standing here today and listening to the debate and the course of the debate that's happened so far. You're losing the, you're losing the run of yourselves. This issue is about public confidence. The previous speaker talked about how the executive has delivered in the last number of months since it came into play after the last election. And it has delivered on many, many fronts. But you see every action and every delivery that's happened to date has been overshadowed by the fact that the DUP can't accept that its leader needs to stand aside to make sure there's a full investigation into the issues which have been played out, drip-fed into the public um, ether for the last number of weeks. I am not interested in the internal wranglings of the DUP. Get on with it. Fight among yourselves. But what I am interested in, public confidence in politics. What I'm interested in is making sure that people have faith that whenever they, they go out on election day and they return us to come up here and do business and deliver for public services and stand up against Tory austerity and to deliver frontline services, that's what I'm interested in. So there's a massive, massive job of work to be done here in relation to public confidence. And the best way 
we feel, Sinn Féin feels to do that, is to make sure that the First Minister stands aside because she has a conflict of interest. There can't be a full investigation with the First Minister uh, in any way, have a, her hands in terms of the investigation, how that's um, played out and how that's investigated. The only way we're going to restore that public confidence, if it's totally independent, if it's not, not one of us can touch it, I think it has to be that independent investigation. So for me, the message that needs to go out to the public today is a genuine message. This RHI scandal, we have to get to the bottom of it. We need to know the ins and outs, we need to know the, the design of the scheme, we need to know who did what, when they did it, how they did it, with whose influence they did it. We need all those, let me finish this point, we need to, you know, all that information needs to be in the public discourse. Secondly, the public need to know that action is being taken to stop the flow of money out of the public purse. That is key in all of this. The public need to know and have faith that whenever a problem was identified, whenever a, a scandal was uncovered, that it was stopped. So we need to do that. And thirdly, all of this has to be in the public discourse. Everybody needs to know exactly who benefited from this scheme, when they're going to benefit, and all that information needs to be out there. And for me, those three things are key. Our position is very, very clear. We've made it absolutely crystal clear. The First Minister, Arlene Foster, needs to step aside while this investigation happens. Whenever I listen to the proposers of the, of the motion today, I, in, in some senses, I doubt your motivation because I've listened to your antics I've listened to your contribution today. The public aren't interested in playing games. The public are interested in answers. The best way to do that is to have this full investigation. Let me make this point. Let me make this point. The proposers of the motion focus on one issue, the issue of Arnie Foster standing down. And I've said I agree with that. But your motion doesn't go far enough. Your motion doesn't look at the whole gambit. Your motion does not look at the need for the investigation. Your motion does not look at every other issue that needs to be out there in the public. So that's why we've tabled an amendment, which obviously, given all the antics that went on this morning, the Speaker, for his own um, reasons, decided uh, that he wouldn't accept the, the amendment. But we will bring that amendment back as a motion, and I welcome the fact that Naomi Long has said that the Alliance Party will be able to support that or could support that in, in when we come back to that early in the new year. So I, I think this, this really is stop getting on with all the nonsense. I actually think the institution are taking an absolute kick in here. I am absolutely wedded to delivering frontline public services for individuals. I'm a health minister with massive challenges in terms of budgetary issues and trying to do all the things that we need to do to increase our investment in primary care. And I think that those are the things that the public want to hear us talking about, not this stuff. So for me today, this is about antics. This is about stunts. This is about, you'll have your opportunity to speak. This is about antics. This is about stunts. Let's get back to the crux of this issue. Credibility. Integrity. Each and every one of us need to have it. Arlene Foster, needs, Arlene Foster needs to step aside. We've made it very, very clear. But let's use the next number of weeks to reflect on that. Whenever we come back to our motion, which we have now tabled for debate early in the new year, I look forward to all those who've proposed the motion today to support that motion. Because that, that, actually, that actually is the key to delivering in terms of what the public are asking for. The public mood, people are angry. People want answers. People deserve answers. We're going to deliver that. Because I will not focus, I will not be distracted, I will not be distracted by party politics. This is not an orange and green issue, this is not a party issue between parties. This is about public confidence, integrity, and that's what I'm most interested in in relation to how we take things forward. So in the future, and I ask the member to bring her remarks to a close. Gormi Ogun Leshkan Kolya. Again, the only two points I want to make integrity, credibility, stop playing games, the give the public answers. The, members, the first minister needs to stand aside. The time is up. I, the member's time is up, and can I ask members not to be making comments from a sedentary position? I call Lord Morrow. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, I think we weren't long in the chamber today when we discovered the whole nature of this uh, motion. When we had earlier today the Minister coming, the First Minister who was asked to come to the House, was willing to come to the House, came to the House and to uh, put herself in front of members here for any interrogation and any cross-examination. But all those sitting to my right hand, they said, look, we're not interested in the facts here. The facts don't bother us in the slightest. We're just interested in what hits the headlines, whether it's in the printed media, the watching media, the listening media, or anything else. That is all they are interested in. So what did they do then? They jumped up and said, we will not be listening to any facts, folks. We must get out of this house because the facts will, would embarrass us. And so they now gowl here today. You always know, Madam, 
You always know, Principal Deputy Speaker, when you throw a stone into a pack of dogs, you always know the one you've hit. It's the one that gowls the loudest. And we, what we have right round this chamber today is a lot of people gowling and shouting, but not coming forward with very many facts. They just want to generate a whole lot of heat. <laughs> so, but they don't want... They don't, they, don't, they don't want to generate a lot of light because there is no light within them. No, no, not ju well, just not at the moment, maybe later. But, Principal Deputy Speaker, this motion, to say the least, is a disgraceful attempt, nothing short of it, a disgraceful attempt by failed parties to create the impression that the First Minister has failed to observe the highest standards of propriety and regularity in relation to the stewardship of public funds. But you know, they haven't produced a scintilla of evidence or facts, not one. Now, Mr. Steve Aiken, who I never knew till he came into this house, but I learned one thing from him very quickly. He is an absolute maestro at exaggeration. My goodness, he can lift a pinhead and he can make it into a mountain instantly. Instantly. And just let me remind him. Just let me, just let me remind him he was at it today. He talks about the four hundred million pounds. And that's the country. Hold on a minute, hold on a minute. Can I ask You've members not to be making had your say. Look uh, good. At least there's a bit of humility in here. Uh, so he talks about this four hundred million pounds. Well, £400 million has not been spent, Mr. Aiken. But then he goes on. What does he say? What's happening in our prisons every week? A suicide every week. Where is that happening? This is unbelievable stuff. We have gone into the line of fantasy and make-believe and grab the headlines and say the super things and the media, they will come racing for it. Now, Right, okay, come on. Yes, the member has uh, asked us to give him facts, and the fact of the matter is, is if this money that's been committed, four hundred million pounds, cannot be clawed back, that will be taken away from our roads, from our hospitals, from our social housing, to the frontline services much in need. There's facts for you. And the member has an extra minute. Well, could I say to Mr. Allen, here's some facts for you. Had you been in the House today, I ask members to address their comments. To the I chair. forgot nearly. The member. And uh, could I say to Mr. Allen, the facts are these: that the First Minister sat at the dispatch box this morning and explained and outlined in some graphic detail how she was dealing with this issue. But Mr. Allen was bound. No, no, hold on. You weren't here to hear. You weren't here. You weren't here. You ran away. Can, you, you ran. You. Can I remind? Would the member please take his I will. to make his comments through the chair? And I hope I hope I don't have to repeat that. Well, I hope yes, I understand what you say, but I hope the members would give me the courtesy of being heard. Now I suspect they don't like what I'm hearing. But you know something? You're going to hear it anyway. And let's turn then to Mr. Nesbitt. Mr. Yes, of course. Because Mr. Nesbitt has the unenviable job now of getting the monkey off his back. And the monkey is this. He was the great white hope for the Ulster Unionist Party. <laughs> the Ulster Unionist Party that had dominated the political scene for so long. And they wheeled in this TV kid, right? And they said, this is a boy that will save us. What happened? He led his party to the lowest vote in their whole history. And now he sees the real threat as Arlene Foster, and he must get rid of Arlene Foster. You'll not be getting rid of her. You'll not be getting rid of her. And then we turn to the SDLP. And they again had a catastrophic election result under their young leader, the young pretender, who tells them that they're going to lead, and they're sinking desperately. They sink so low that even they will now name children's play parks after terrorists so that they can court the support from Sinn Féin supporters, and it didn't work. And they all sit with blushed faces and say, well, we're sorry, but we've got a thing we can do about it. But look, let it be said very clear that the same Mr. Nesbitt, and I'll leave him for a minute, then we have the Sanctimonious Alliance Party. 
they, have, they are whiter than white and purer than pure. And they come into this house with this sanctimonious look upon their face and they tell us that they wouldn't do this. They, well, we know the fiasco that Mr. Ford made of the policing depot in Cookstown. Where is our policing depot today when he spent and squandered millions of pounds the members, and had no, no, the we members heard nothing from him? Is up. Before we, I call our next speaker, there's an awful lot of noise from the back benches here and I'd ask people to respect people who are speaking. And can I ask that people don't make, make comments through the chair rather than shouting across the chamber? I call Jenny Palmer. Thank you, Madam Deputy Principal Speaker. There are two principal reasons why the First Minister must take responsibility for this mess and stand aside. Firstly, the devastating blow she has done with her ineptitude to her international business reputation. For a minister who prided herself on the levels of FDI that she attracted, who boasted of how attractive she would make Northern Ireland for investment, has brought disdain on these institutions which are now held up to public ridicule. Yes, I agree that we ought to fight to limit the damage done to our public purse. We need to stop the bleed as best we can. The First Minister is not a safe pair of hands on Northern Ireland's public finances. She is clearly not across the detail, despite her public utterances that her, quote, detail is important. Why would businesses look to come here when our First Minister has made such a catastrophic de policy decisions? She was the First Minister. She was responsible. What must the United Kingdom Treasury think of us and our apparent inability to manage public funds? Will this impact on our future ask for additional block grant funding? What is the head of the civil service going to do about the possible negligence issues amongst senior staff? The DUP, and in particular their leadership, is central to this, and the First Minister stepping aside will help to fix some of the harm done to our business reputation. The second reason for the, for the First Minister to step aside is this. No one can trust her to do the right thing. Madam Deputy Principal Speaker, how on earth can the First Minister expect anyone to put their faith in her while this issue is being investigated? No, I won't. How foolish does she think that the people of Northern Ireland are, that they would trust her to be impartial and allow a report to be published and its recommendations enacted which will damn her and her party. Does she, honestly expect, does she honestly expect this House and the people of Northern Ireland to have such short memories? Does the First Minister expect the way I was treated to be forgotten and the slate wiped clean? I'm sorry, Deputy Principal Speaker, but it seems that she apparently has forgotten what happened the last time a DUP minister was investigated for loathsome practice and the disdain with which the DUP treats committee reports. A report was issued in 2014 in which I was vindicated and a certain gentleman sitting in the DUP backbenches as well as the special advisor that is conveniently retired from politics shortly before this mess was exposed were found wanting. That report produced by the Assembly Social Development Committee after exhaustive evidence sessions and research, that report contained the truth of the matter. How did the First Minister's party react to the truth being shown? They tried to silence it. They tried to put forward their own spin in the form of a minority report. They tried to use the petition of concern to defend the party and the minister from the truth coming out. They treated this assembly, the committee, and me with contempt. Why on earth should we ever trust that party to accept the truth? Why would anyone doubt for a moment that if the report produced by the PAC was unpalatable for DUP, that they wouldn't attempt to water it down or block it? They have done it before. They did it to me. Even if a report is issued independently, one that rightfully points to the odious incompetence at the heart of the DUP, without the proper assembly powers, why would we doubt that they will misuse the petitions of concern and other mechanisms, mechanisms to insulate their party from justice? No, Deputy Principal Speaker. I am afraid that I, for one, having been through purgatory because of the DUP, I certainly won't allow them to conceal the truth behind opaque assembly mechanisms. Arling Foster is too closely tied to the scandal. Her party has a miserable history of protecting themselves from any meaningful scrutiny by this assembly. And for that reason, she absolutely must stand aside while a genuinely independent investigation is done.
Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Here, here, here. Here, John O'Dowd. I call John O'Dowd. Uh, before us, or in the Chamber, over this last number of hours, we have had two attempts to close down an investigation. In the motion before us from the opposition parties and the Alliance Party, we have a proposal to come to the conclusion of an investigation before it is started. And that surely isn't the way we should be doing business. Because the motion does, as, as outlined to us, states that the, act, or the First Minister uh, acting in a role as daddy minister, acted in a way which put public funds in severe jeopardy and squandered them. Now, is that the case? It's quite possibly the case. Quite possibly the case. But to reach that conclusion, you require an investigation. And the motion before us today from the opposition parties does not include any investigation. It does not include reference to a judge-led inquiry. It does not include reference to any material as to how that inquiry would be carried out in any way. So the motion itself is fatally flawed and premature. This morning we had a statement from the leader of the DUP, which uh, well, perhaps in a moment I'll see. Uh, we had a statement from the leader of the DUP which reached the conclusions of a DUP investigation. And I reference 15 <coughs> conclusions in it, or references to the truth, or references to fact. And I'm sorry, but that's simply not good enough. It's not up to the opposition to find the leader of the DUP guilty, and it's not up to the DUP to find the leader of the DUP innocent. And that's why we have brought forward a motion which calls for a judge-led inquiry, a judicial figure appointed from outside this jurisdiction to carry out an investigation into the rights and wrongs of what happened around the RHI scheme, which political figures were involved in it, which civil service figures were or were not involved in it, and who benefited from it. That's how you do business. That's how you do business in relation to placing accusations in front of people, whether it's in the Assembly or whether it's in a court of law. That's the rules by which we have all signed up to. And I listened with interest, I have to say, uh, to the leader of the DUP talking about trial by television and uh, ensuring that accusations are fully investigated, etc. I hope they stick to that mantra in the future, because I can think of my colleague Martin O'Muller only a few short months ago, and the same principles and the same high integrity was not adopted at that stage. But if we stick to the rules, then we can all play by the rules. In terms of what happened around RHI, there was a flaw in the system, without doubt, and we all acknowledge that. Now, everybody accepts there was a flaw in the system. The question that has to be answered is this. When was the flaw identified? Who identified it and who benefited from it? Because at the heart of this is not an investigation into did a minister not carry out their functions properly? Did a civil servant not carry out their functions properly or a scrutiny committee not carry out their <coughs> functions properly? The general public, and I think they're, they're quite right to be so, are highly suspicious that someone or a group of selected people benefited to the tunes of hundreds of thousands of pounds individually and perhaps up to a million pounds in one individual case of public money. And who told them of this lucrative deal? Who spotted the flaw and went out and met with members of business groups, of farmers, who may or may not be contributors to the DUP? Because, folks, that's what the heart is at the heart of this corruption. Was there members or supporters of the Democratic Unionist Party or other political parties in this chamber who were taken to one side, shown the details of the scheme, and said, buy into this and you'll make money? That's the public suspicion, folks. And I'm sorry, but the DUP investigation that was read out to us this morning doesn't cover that issue, and it needs to be covered. And I also want to end on this comment. I believe part of the problem is here that some in this chamber believe that we have a Prime Minister of Northern Ireland. We don't. You are in the Joint First and Deputy First Minister's office, and that's the way things have to operate here. And I don't care what the legal advice that was given to the Speaker this morning. I'll give you some serious political advice. 
To see if the jointly of that office is corrupted, then I doubt there will be an office. Thank you. I call Simon Hamilton. Principal. We ask, uh, Mr. Hamilton, are you speaking in your? No, I'm speaking as a, an ordinary member, Principal Deputy Speaker. Principal Deputy Speaker, I, I rise as an ordinary member uh, to oppose the uh, motion that is before the House this afternoon, and I do so because the motion is based on a, a, a litany of erroneous charges, charges that are all without evidence, and I want to do my best in the time that is available to me to address some of the issues surrounding at least two of those charges. The first one is that, and it seems to be the argument coming forward from opposition benches, that Arlene Foster should take full and should take sole responsibility for mistakes that were made, for flaws that were inherent within the original design of the Renewable Heat Incentive Scheme. Now, the fir the first, oh, I've hardly started, for goodness sake. <laughs> the, the, first, the First Minister has made it clear that she does take responsibility. She is answerable to this House. She is answerable to this Assembly. She made herself answerable to it this morning at this dispatch box. At the request of members who have this, whose name this motion is in, yet whenever the First Minister came to the House this morning to give a full and complete explanation of the circumstances behind the RHI scheme and her involvement in it, where were the opposition parties? They weren't here. They ran away. Now, the, the, the charge is that the First Minister should take sole responsibility and full responsibility for the flaws in the design of the scheme. Principal Deputy Speaker, that, that completely misses and obscures the involvement of members on all sides of this House and indeed others, well, critically well, in no, the design can't. of the scheme. Well, yes, I will give away. Would the member agree with me it may be a deliberate ploy from some of the other members so as to take the focus merely off themselves and some of their actions whenever the scheme was going to be closed? And the member has an extra minute. Thank you, President. So I thank the member for, for his intervention. I think he makes a very, very, very salient point. The, the House knows full well bad advice was given by so-called policy experts within the department in terms of the design of the scheme, that there were consultants brought in, <laughs> external consultants brought in to review the scheme. They have admitted to the Public Accounts Committee that they have made mistakes and they have apologised for that. Um, and this Assembly voted for, this is not something that went through by negative resolution or didn't have to come to this House. This House voted for the regulations setting up the scheme. It passed through and was scrutinised by the Committee. The then Chair of the Committee, Mr Patsy McGloan, is on record in this House during the debate in which the regulations were passed saying, quote, the committee's scrutiny of the development of the renewable heat incentive has been considerable and reflects the importance and long-term nature of the proposals. That's what Mr. McGloan said in this House. So this attempt, let's not forget, Principal Deputy Speaker, and all that is said here and outside of this House, let's not forget for one second the role of members of this House, parties on all sides of this House, and, and, and in the creation of this scheme and the scrutiny of this scheme. The scheme. And no one, and I'm happy to say this, no one, politicians, civil servants or external consultants, spotted the flaws. None. And members here wish to wipe away their involvement in the creation of the scheme and their, their part in passing these proposals. And, and, and they don't want to take responsibility for it. And they should take responsibility for it. The second, one, the second charge that I want to, to deal with, Principal Deputy Speaker, is that the First Minister, and I've heard it from, from previous speakers, somehow intervened to keep the scheme open for longer periods, for, for some nefarious reason, which nobody seems to want to talk about or make any suggestion about, but the, the, the intervention by the First Minister was to keep the scheme open. There is no evidence, not a single shred of evidence of anything, any involvement by the current First Minister in the issues surrounding the 2015 change in the tariff of the scheme. In respect of 2016, however, the First Minister was heavily involved in the, and, and did intervene at that time. But her intervention at that time, President Deputy Speaker, was to the benefit of the scheme. It was, it was to bring forward the closure of the scheme to an earlier date than the then Minister had actually agreed. The then Minister had agreed to close the scheme at, in mid-March. The intervention of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister at that time brought forward the closure of the scheme to February. So if anything, in respect of that charge, Principal Deputy Speaker, we should be thanking the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister for their intervention. Uh, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, Arlene Foster, lest there be any doubt, will not 
be stepping aside. And why would she? She has done nothing wrong. She has nothing to fear. And that is why she has called for and endorsed an independent investigation of the RHI scheme so that all of the evidence is out there and the truth will be found. Because she fears nothing from the truth. There is, there is no evidence whatsoever of any wrongdoing, yet people want to hang her on the basis of no evidence, no substantial evidence at all. And, and she certainly, Principal Bleibley Speaker, will not be stepping down at the behest of her political opponents, who have shown themselves by their actions today and in previous days to be of no interest in the substance of this and only interested in stunts. And, and she won't be going anywhere, Principal Bleibley Speaker, because she has a job to do. I am working closely with her on developing a plan to mitigate the worst cost and reduce substantially the cost of the RHI scheme. Arning Foster is a leader, and leaders walk towards the problem. They don't walk away like others do whenever, whenever they have the opportunity to lead, whenever they have the opportunity the to take on responsibility of government, they walk away. Arning Foster will be walking nowhere. Yeah. I call Claire Hanna. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And I think it's fair to say belief in the, the will and the ability of, of this Assembly has been low uh, in, in recent years. But this fiasco has turned that public uh, frustration and dissatisfaction into anger. And the First Minister has had, a, had ample opportunity over the last two weeks to restore uh, some confidence and some dignity in this institution and to instigate a, 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 a thorough public inquiry to get to the root of how and why $400 million of public money is being so shamefully uh, wasted. We want to be clear that a fudge inquiry set up and directed by this executive or its proxies won't be able to get to the bottom of that scandal uh, and any brinkmanship uh, about and risk this structure, despite that deep frustration, will leave us with no possibility of getting to the bottom of it. Not for the first time, I wonder if the party across care who they make cynical when they can just trot out, as the First Minister and her colleagues have done, uh, the old head count lines that this is about nationalism and others uh, ganging up on the leader of unionism and while the benign no I won't while the benign taxpayer here is supposed to just continue picking up the tab and becoming more and more disenfranchised the arrogance this morning is breathtaking through the first half you may think this is hilarious but nobody out there is laughing at this loss of money and the defense of spreading it about of blaming it on anybody but the boss on the civil servants on the opposition on the media of using uh, what about her? Repeated versions of the story and a best defence of not being across the detail. The party who've been moaning about faceless, unelected bureaucrats in Europe are apparently content to let the spads run the show. And the party that can't even cut and paste London's scheme uh, tell us that they have the competence to lead Northern Ireland. This scandal represents the ineptitude and the dysfunction uh, of this executive. Uh, and, and the fact is that during the in out charade uh, of last year, uh, while Arlene Foster was left to guard against rogues and renegades, while, according to Peter Robinson, she was there to ensure that nationalists and Republicans are not able to take financial and other decisions that may be detrimental to Northern Ireland, a well intentioned scheme uh, was being apparently used as a ruse to make money for those in the know. It is clear now who the rogues and the renegades are. It's clear as well which party was. In, uh, the driving seat here, uh, but we're left wondering what the other partner in government has been doing. Like Nama and Sif, Sinn Féin have either been turning a blind eye here or merely along for the ride in government but not in power. We defend the joint nature of OFM and DFM as we did this morning when we wouldn't listen uh, to an illegitimate preaching to the choir uh, this morning, but people will want to know that there is indeed uh, a joint office and that somebody is in there to prevent what really is becoming worse than the worst excesses of one party uh, stormant rule in the past. And if, if Sinn Féin want to, uh, as if, if they believe it is what Mr O'Dowd just said it was, that this has been uh, corruption, if they want to do anything other than throw shapes, they can support our motion today to exclude. And if they want to, on the long finger in the new year, build on that with an inquiry, and we will all be supportive of an inquiry, they can do so, but there's no reason uh, why they can't support our motion. At, at a time when household budgets are under pressure, the sums here are horrifying, and I've heard very little uh, about those sums from the benches 
opposite. And the fact that apparently because it was London money, it was okay to squander is, is really breathtaking and it's arrogant. The fact is, whether it comes from London or Brussels or Washington or Belfast, somebody earned that money and paid it in, and all taxpayers are uh, in, uh, entitled to know that their money is being uh, fairly spent. And clearly, the environmental, I won't have a lot to get through here, the environmental aims of the scheme were completely ignored by the department, taking it from the Department of Energy and Climate Change and making it into what apparently has just been a money-making scheme and has, in fact, uh, led to more environmental degradation as not just public money, uh, but the materials involved go up in smoke. And the ramifications are being felt not just over the next 20 years, but in the fact that today we were supposed to be here discussing uh, the budget. Instead, we're discussing this fiasco, and at a time when this executive needs more scrutiny uh, and lot, not less, the opposition will not have access to those budget figures this side of recess. Mr Speaker, alleged, alleged cronyism and corruption are written all over this in the minds uh, of the public, and Mrs Foster has an opportunity to restore some faith. You refer to conviction without trial. Mr Robinson, Peter Robinson, set the precedent for that. The civil service used the same uh, mechanism. If somebody is being investigated, they will stand aside. This very weekend, you suspended a member of your own party uh, pending an investigation. Take the plank out of your own eye. Take the opportunity to, 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 to restore some confidence to this assembly. I thank the member for giving way. No, I, I haven't given oh. oh. way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I will. Uh, would the member agree to that indeed some on the, the benches opposite would have short memories when in fact uh, Mr O'Dowd was alluding to it earlier where they suggested that Marcino Muller should step aside during uh, an investigation into the affairs around Mr Bryson? Yes, I, will, I, I, I agree. Yes, and and if, 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 the, if the party opposite are so confident are so confident that no wrong being has done, let all the facts go into the public domain. Let it be uh, dealt with at a remove from this Assembly uh, and, and let us restore some confidence in the Assembly. I call William Humphreys. Principal Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm saddened to Paul by this motion because this motion, as the leader of the SDLP, clearly confirmed in his contribution to this debate, is personal. I met Arlene Foster over 30, coming near 30 years ago, and I've always believed Arlene Foster to be a true friend and colleague and a person of the highest integrity, honesty, loyalty, hard work, commitment, and dedication. Principal Deputy Speaker, over the last week, and I think it's fair to talk about the last week because unlike Mrs. Hannah, I recognize that the previous week the minister was over in China fighting to bring jobs and new markets for our pork producers in China only two weeks ago. This all happened when she was out of the country, perhaps no surprise. Principal Deputy Speaker, many politicians and journalists have sought to attack Arlene Foster's character. That portrayal of Arlene Foster, my colleague, my friend, my leader and our First Minister is not what I know and it's not what the people on these benches know of Arlene Foster. I want to speak of Arlene Foster as a minister because following her election to Stormont, Arlene Foster has been a first-class minister, holding the portfolios of environment, debt, finance, and is now our first minister, and a truly outstanding first minister, unpopular within the unionist and the broader Northern Ireland community. There is no doubt that alone she has brought competence, incisiveness, professionalism, and attention to detail to everything and every role that she has done here at Stormont, particularly in ministerial rules. Happy to give away. I'm grateful to the member for giving away. Figures have been bandied around uh, in the media around this issue. Would the member agree it's a bit rich for a party that spent £40 million on a road that was never built to lecture anybody about how to run a government department? Well, I think, and the I member think, has an extra minute. I think that uh, if members remember and choose to remember and deal with facts, not fantasy, in Teddy, the minister led from the front, securing jobs and uh, foreign direct investment to Northern Ireland which even exceeded that going to London and the southeast of England. Her focus and the focus of my party has been on strengthening the economy and her leadership and the results delivered by Arlene Foster are absolutely testament to that. During my short time on the Deddy Committee, I can confirm that Arlene Foster, when she appeared in front of that committee, was absolutely in complete command of that brief. Indeed, most importantly, as a minister, 
not only didn't she enjoy the confidence of that committee, has been, uh, and, and, and also the chairman of the committee has been uh, exemplified by Mr. Hamilton's remarks, she enjoyed the confidence of foreign governments, of foreign investors, of local business, local business associations, and the deed of trade unions. I want to turn to the RHI scheme, uh, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. There is no doubt that in the First Minister's own words in the House this morning, that there have been shocking errors and failures in the RHI scheme and the catalogue of mistakes, without question. It is about this House, its credibility as a House, the Northern Ireland Executive as an Executive, that we have to regain the confidence of the people of Northern Ireland and those people who sent us here to do a job of work. Mr. Speaker, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, it's essential that these errors and mistakes and the scheme are arrested. There must be transparency and there must be openness. There must be an independent investigation. Indeed, that's exactly what the First Minister said this morning in this House. There must be financial recovery. And that's exactly what the First Minister, the Finance Minister and the Economy Minister are working on. Indeed, I understand that's exactly what the Minister, First Minister is doing at this very moment in time. It is absolutely clear, and I have spoken to many people over the last week when I've been out in my constituency and others, that people out there are fearful and are concerned about the levels of money that are being talked about. But the levels of money being talked about in this House, and members know it well, are not the levels of money that have been spent on this scheme. And that's exactly the issue which the First Minister addressed this morning. In conclusion, um, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, I have to say it is for the First Minister, for the Executive and for this House to provide certainty, confidence and surety to the people of Northern Ireland. It is our duty, it is our responsibility. But as a member of the Democratic Unionist Party and as a chair of a committee in this House, I have to say that I know Arlene Foster. I know Arlene Foster a long, long time. She has the skills, the talent, the attributes and the determination and will, and will clear up what is a mess and will see the confidence restored to the people of Northern Ireland for this House yeah. and for these institutions. She has my full support. Yeah. I called Stephen Farry. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Principal uh, Deputy Speaker. The situation today is uh, continuing to escalate in hopes that some of us maybe had, somewhat naively perhaps, that uh, things would be brought to a head and confidence restored, I think, are being sorely dashed. But the issue does remain one of public confidence. And public confidence is extremely low, and we have to be humble right across all corners of the Assembly and recognise that. And that does build upon what has been a very difficult and challenging uh, six months for the Assembly, where it has become characterised uh, by a lack of openness and transparency on the part of the Executive and a succession of scandals. And it's important to bear in mind that the current fiasco we're discussing around renewable heat, while the most extreme, is not the only issue of public concern at present. But this has now become a crisis of power sharing. And the institutions themselves are being pushed uh, to their limits. The checks and balances that will be uh, at play in other normal democracies, and I accept we're not a fully normal democracy, are not at all present in our own situation. For if this was happening elsewhere, it, the expectation, both internally within the legislature and in the media, would lead to the main players voluntarily stepping aside while the process of restoring confidence played out, and we, we can point to numerous examples of that in neighbouring jurisdictions and indeed uh, further afield. Our members have also cited the President of Peter Robinson in 2010, and I, I would say to the DUP, insofar as they are denying uh, that uh, there is any case for Mrs Foster stepping aside, they are implicitly actually attacking Mr Robinson for actually having the decency to step aside in 2010, and I would stress ultimately he was cleared as part of that process. Yeah. Member and colleagues and others in this House have had the best part of a week in the press throwing questions and accusations at the First Minister. The First Minister made herself available for questioning, 
for scrutiny. Do you think the public out there really care about this joint nature defence that you're putting up for not being here asking the questions? No, they do not. What I do, and I was saying to Mr Stalford that I think he should care about it as well, because I think we do need to take very seriously what has happened today and the wider implications that will flow from that. I mean, there is a case for potentially reviewing the, the joint nature of the Executive Office because it is, fr frankly, a cumbersome wreck where it takes weeks, if not months or years, for answers to, to emerge from questions and correspondence to be addressed because of the, the nature of the joint sign-off. But you don't do a unilateral run at that, which happened today. And I dare say that what happened, has happened today does set a precedent. And frankly, Mrs Foster was tone deaf to the political circumstances in the Chamber today because, frankly, if she was a true leader, she would have voluntarily step back and actually understood the damage that she was potentially doing to institutions by continuing on what was a solar run. Now, I would like to have the proper forum to ask, ask the questions. No doubt that will emerge in due course, but doing it today in this half-baked manner was entirely counterproductive. But let's take a look at some of the issues before us. They are how the scheme was designed, how the whistleblower was handled, the nature of the closure of the scheme, concerns over potential conflicts of interests, and arising from that, we do need to see the full list of those who were recipients of the grants. Frankly, an opt-in scheme is not good enough because that will have questions as to who are the people who haven't opted in. And alongside that, we need to see the publication of the donors to the DEP, so people can actually can, can make a full contrast between the two. It may be perfectly innocent, but that is important information that should be out there in the public interest. And there's also a wider challenge in terms of the DEP's approach uh, to governance. There are issues in terms of Arlene Foster's attention uh, to detail. When were questions asked? Were there relevant questions asked indeed? Uh, did she ask at the outset, is this approach we're adopting going to be sustainable? What are the risks? Any minister doing a job should ask those questions of their officials whenever a submission, particularly one of the potential costs, come across their desk. And it is right uh, that questions are asked of the civil service, but let me say quite clearly as well, the civil service includes many brilliant and dedicated people, but they're not infallible. And that's why ministers and special advisers are there. They are, in, in, in effect, the internal line of defence. They should be having the same scrutiny in their, in their departments that they expect the Assembly to have out on the outside. And I can certainly say from my own experience that both I and my special advisor caught things that were not caught by the, by, by the civil service and saved money uh, as a consequence of that scrutiny. But we, there's also a wider question here, and I have put this on the record. We have to be concerned about the potential politicisation of the civil service, who are becoming a political football in this issue, whether we dragged out backwards and forwards in terms of being cited to defend one political point against another. And we need to be very careful as well that we don't lose the impartiality of the civil service. This is issue in terms of the wider approach, in terms of decision making between ministers and SPADs. And I can also say this is not how Alliance did government. Our ministers and special advisers knew the boundaries of their respective roles and respected that, and in turn were respected by the civil servants. And I'm sure that point applies to those who operated from many other political parties as well. We then have the issue how this issue has been handled in the media over the past number of days, the refusal to apologise, the refusal to accept responsibility until quite late uh, in, in the day, and the, the, then the need for what is a proper public inquiry. And on that point, can I just stress that the motion today is necessary, but it's not sufficient. If we had had the voluntary stepping aside, the motion wouldn't, wouldn't be necessary. But it is necessary in that context. But it doesn't preclude us coming back and, and discussing on a separate day a separate motion regarding the public inquiry. And we're certainly happy to do that and give it our support. I call Roy Beggs. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I rise to support the motion. Uh, the First Minister, uh, as a result of your flawed renewable heat scheme, some £485 million pounds of taxpayer funds have been committed wastefully from future budgets. That's a big number. Unused barns are being heated while many struggle to heat their homes. There have been inadequate inspections. All facts. I would acknowledge that many businesses have been attracted to the scheme, particularly in the early days for sound environmental reasons, reasons but rather than any means of generating profit. But clearly that changed. The integrity of this institution is at stake, and who is accountable for these hundreds of million pounds of costs and losses? The Nolan Show this morning revealed that Minister Foster received a personal email uh, directly from the whistleblower in September 2013, with the specific warnings detailed 
but they were not acted upon. Explain. In addition, this Northern Ireland executive is now in a state of turmoil. The tension of DUP ministers is not on the well-being of the people of Northern Ireland, but of continuing personal power. Today was pencilled in for the draft budget originally. There has been no talk of it, but without proper planning and advanced planning for all the different departments, for the agencies, for community and voluntary sector, poor decision-making will result. Again, I say that the executive is in disarray. So rather than talking about a budget that focuses on uh, this renewable heat and the losses incurred. When Mr Robinson's actions uh, became the political focus, as others have said, he voluntarily stood aside during the completion of investigation and allowed government to function. I suggest you should be doing the same. The Renewable Heat Initiative was introduced uh, late 2000, uh, uh, 2012, when you were the Deputy Minister, the Minister were responsible. A short time later, later in 2013, further protections were added in GB. In GB, there is tiering, which greatly reduces the payment after uh, a, a, a certain number of hours usage, and digression, which was quarterly changes in the level of the support offered depending on the demand. You, Minister, took the policy decision to not introduce either of these two protections. For that, you are answerable. That uh, vote was not put to this assembly. You took that decision. The Northern Ireland Office, in their report, highlighted uh, in uh, a case of a portly industry boiler, you, which might have been used 24 hours a day, that it would give an 82 per cent annual return on investment at public expense. Outrageous. Minister, you, you then became uh, Finance Minister, and I agree with the comments uh, with my colleague that a rugby hospital pass was given to uh, uh, Minister Bell. But there must have been alarm bells ringing. There must have been alarm bells ringing in May 2015 when Deddy sought reapproval of the Renewable Heat Initiative uh, with, with the Department of Finance and at a very senior level. So how was that handled from then on? Uh, uh, the Assembly uh, member Bell's evidence tells of the DUP, OFM, DFM, SPADs, gatekeepers, uh, dela causing delays in the problem. Why uh, were there delays in publishing uh, the companies and charity details involved? Can we have it? How is this a, a data protection issue? Who actually benefited during this critical period? Lots of questions that remain unanswered. And it appears to me there was a lack of uh, uh, focus on the value for money with a, an assumption that don't worry about it, Westminster's picking up the bill. It's all our taxpayers' money. Minister Foster, you were and are responsible. The DUP did not give, me, give way to me on numerous occasions, and I am not giving way to you. You are and were responsible for your special advisors who have been out of control. SPAS can be incredibly powerful. And we learned that in the Social Development Committee when I served on it, where we had to revert to the uh, 1998 Act to uncover the result of an independent investigation into Stephen Brimison, the DSD Special Advisor in relation to Red Sky. The investigation recommendation that a formal disciplinary action should be held, but the Minister refused to agree to it. Stephen Brimison, well, Stone will certainly will. Uh, do you agree that it's not unreasonable uh, that the First Minister should be held accountable for her bad judgment in this case? <coughs> the, the are lots of decisions made, and civil servants can present ideas to the Minister. Ministers should be also looking wide rounder at what's happening elsewhere. Ultimately, as the Minister uh, for the Department uh, of uh, Enterprise, Trade and Investment, she took decisions and judgments and decided not to enter just protections. So uh, Stephen Brimison uh, then gave evidence uh, to the, the Social Development Committee, and he stonewalled. I do not recall. I do not recall. What happened to him? Rather than being disciplined by the DUP, he was promoted by Peter Robinson. And subsequent to that, subsequent to that, what did Arlene Foster do? She reappointed him. Where is your humility? Where is your humility? Clearly, we have too many spads. They are too well paid. They are paid even more than ministers. 
The, the power is going to their head. They are protected by DUP ministers. Clearly, it is time to, re to assess what has been happening. And there is a huge amount of noise coming from my right, and I would ask the, the members refrain from being so noisy and interrupting members. Now, point of order. Um, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, the member keeps speaking about a Stephen Grimmonson. Who is Stephen Grimmonson? <laughs> there is no person of that name ever worked for the DUP. Can the member take a seat, please. I think we all know. We all. We all know who the member is referring to. Point of order. Point of order. Apologies, but I, can I clarify? It's Stephen Brimstone, if the member does not know. Order. Order. Before I take your point of order, point of order must be heard. Stephen Farry, point of order. Just for the record, can the record actually show that Stephen Brimstone actually worked for the departments that he was a special advisor to, not the DEP, unless Lord Morrow has actually let the cat out of the bag whenever he says he worked for the DEP? The, the member's comments are on the record. Now, let us move on. I call Stephen Agnew. Iram, or Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. From department to department, Arlene Foster has presided over a catalogue of failures. As Environment Minister, she rejected multiple calls following a public consultation to implement an independent environmental protection agency. Later, the Mills Review highlighted the systemic failure within the then DOE and the £250 million cleanup cost that we could be faced with in dealing with illegal waste dumping. There is an opportunity to put in proper regulation and enforcement. Ms Foster uh, declined that opportunity and the public will be left with the bill. As any minister, uh, we lost a £1 billion uh, offshore wind farm project to Northern Ireland that would have been the largest in the whole of the UK. It was an international uh, consortium put, put it together, including a business in my own constituency of Hollywood. The self-appointed champion of foreign direct investment did not get involved, did not secure that investment for Northern Ireland and another uh, failure happened under her watch. The renewable heat incentive scheme, successful in the rest of the UK, has been botched in Northern Ireland alone. Arlene Foster blamed it on her civil servants. She blamed it on her successor. She blamed it on the media. She blamed it on the opposition. She blamed it on everyone except the person who was in charge at the time, Arlene Foster. And she has form of blaming things on others, of abdicating responsibility to her civil servants. Back when I was first elected to this house in 2011, I called her out for not declaring land that her husband owned in relation to the licensed fracking area. She said she had nothing to do with giving license, petroleum exploration licenses out in Northern Ireland. It wasn't her who signed the licenses, it was her civil servants. And what we're left with, Principal Deputy Speaker, is a picture of a minister either who does not accept the responsibility that she has or who is incompetent in discharging that responsibility. Today's motion of no confidence, I rise to support it on behalf of the Green Party because I cannot have confidence in a minister who does not stand up, who does not take responsibility when things go wrong. This debate we're having, the media Ferrari that's been around it, and rightly has been around it given the sums of money involved, could have been avoided had she stepped up at the time, had, when the feelings come to light, had she stepped up and said, I got this wrong. I think we wouldn't have seen the heat that this debate has caused had she accepted responsibility from the start. To have had a track record, track record of such failure time and time again Principal Deputy Speaker, can only lead me to the conclusion that Arlene Foster is a very shrewd, very ruthless and very skilled politician. But unfortunately, I can only conclude that she is an incompetent minister. The right thing to do would be to step down pending investigation. 
It is the normal due process in any organisation for when someone is accused of mishandling um, in their role, and as indeed um, Mr Jonathan Bell has faced, he's been accused of, of breaching party rules. He's been asked to step down without prejudice pending investigation. It's time that Arlene Foster did the same. The people of Northern Ireland deserve answers. They deserve to know how this was allowed to happen under Ms Foster's governance. They deserve to know what went wrong, and they deserve the confidence that the mistakes um, will be learned from, and in future uh, such mistakes won't be made again. But they cannot have that confidence um, while Arlene Foster uh, remains at the helm and will be involved in setting the terms of reference um, of any inquiry that goes forward. It must be independent, it must be judge-led, and we need the confidence to ensure that Mrs Foster's fingerprints are not on that inquiry. So, whilst I hear the objection that today's motion doesn't go far enough, I see no objection in the content of this motion, which asks Mrs Foster to step aside Can I ask while the member to bring his comments to a close? Paul, Paul Frew. Well, Deputy Speaker, and I rise, of course, to reject uh, the motion before us uh, today uh, with regards to the exclusion of a minister of this House, a minister who Northern Ireland needs to get us through what is some of the darkest weeks in devolution. There is absolutely no doubt about it. This has been a dark couple of weeks. There have been massive issues and failings. And that has to be investigated. But whilst that is being investigated, we need to ensure that we get something in place that will be able to claw back some of the money that isn't spent yet, but that will be projected to be spent, back into the public purse. Now, who is best placed to do that? Out of all the MLAs in this House, who is best placed to do that? I believe it's the First Minister, Arlene Foster. And this charge, of course, I agree with Sinn Féin on this matter. This has been a circus today. And I'll tell you why. The opposition parties have been calling for two weeks flat for the First Minister to come before them to address and answer questions that they have on this renewable heat scheme. And yet, when they had the opportunity today, even this morning, they walked out of this place. Yes, I will give way. Yeah. I very much appreciate the member giving way. He will have heard the uh, speaker say he was granting the statement understanding order 18A. Will the member tell the House what 18A actually is? Well, you can, see, can, before, can I remind members we're in at the debate about a different motion, um, but the member has an extra minute. Yeah, and, and the member, and the member can can take it up with the Speaker with regards to standing orders. But let me just say to, to Mike Nesbitt that the public out there don't give a jot when it comes to what standing order you quote. They want to hear information. They want to hear information about what we're going to do in the future and also facts that lead it to this issue. No, I'm going to make progress. Now, here's the issue. If people feel that the First Minister has failed to observe the highest standards of propriety and regularity in relation to the stewardship of public funds surrounding the Renewable Heat Incentive Scheme. Then I can tell you now, we are all guilty. We are all guilty. Because this scheme came before this House and we all voted for it. It went through rigorous scrutiny. I was on the Edit Committee with a lot of my colleagues and, and the Chairperson Patsy McGlone, who I will say, done a sterling job on that committee and was a, a very decent chairperson, a very fair chairperson. And we scrutinised, as we did with every piece of legislation that came before us, we scrutinised it to death. And this House voted also to close the scheme. But at that point, let me quote some people. SDLP West Tyrone MLA Daniel McCrossan slammed a decision by the Minister John Bell to exit the renewable energy heat incentive. The loss of the scheme which funds renewable heating projects 
to produce renewable energy has predicted to cost 2,000 jobs to the business owner in Oma, expressing concern. We also have, we also have Adrian Cochrane Watson of the UUP. The original 31st March deadline for the sector should be reinstated and honoured. But even he goes further than that. The Minister needs to agree through consultation with the industry groups such as the Federation of Master Builders, a phased winding down period which will allow businesses the opportunity to plan for a change in the revenue scheme. How much longer did Adrian Cochran Watson want to give this scheme? And of course, and of course we have Jim, Jim Alster, who says, those who took up the scheme did so in good faith. Oh, there's a change there. All these businesses and domestic users have been ridiculed in the press over the last two weeks. It's they that feel, what is going on up here? What is going on? No, I won't give way. They now find, he says, they now find they cannot do that and it will cost them hugely. You cannot, you cannot have it both ways, members. We are all responsible for our actions and we're all responsible for this. But let me tell you this. When we were going through the welfare reform crisis that cost this country millions of pounds and if it wasn't for the actions of this party it would have cost us a hundred millions of pounds every year when the grass was growing long when the potholes were not being filled and that's only what the people could see that's what the, only the people could see what about the waiting lists where was the SDLP in that they were playing politics as they are with this issue. The people want to know what happened. Let's have an independent investigation to see what happened. Let's drive this country forward. Who's best placed to do that? The First Minister of this country, Arlene Foster. Let us go forward and let us see if we can organise a plan with the Finance Minister to try and draw back some of the... Ask the, the member to conclude his remarks. That is what the people want to hear. They do not want to see walkouts. You are elected to this place to serve the people. Do not walk out of this place like some set of clowns. Thank you. Members, as this is the first opportunity for Ms. Joanne Bunting to speak as a private member, I should remind the House that it is the Convention that a maiden speech is made without interruption. However, if the member expresses political opinions, she may well find that challenged. Thank you. I call Ms. Joanne Bunting. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It may be pantomime season, but it would better serve this House to move away from play acting and towards resolution of a truly difficult situation in a spirit of cooperation and constructive behaviour. We face a serious situation, and members of this House showed by their actions this morning that they were more interested in assembly process around statements and grandstanding by means of this exclusion motion than in hearing from the First Minister and taking the opportunity to put a direct question to her on the issue. We cannot, we should not, and we must not be in a position where every time an issue of significance is raised in the assembly, politics is allowed to cloud that which is really important. This motion seeks to exclude the First Minister. To what end? She has agreed, indeed supports, an independent inquiry. She has acknowledged and accepted her responsibilities insofar as they lay with her. At no time has she, has she sought to shirk those responsibilities. Rather, as is her way, she has sought to address this problem head on, and members could have heard that this morning had they remained with us. Contrary to the principles of fairness or natural justice, the motion aims to exclude her without a shred of evidence of wrongdoing, but ultimately on the basis of following advice. We all agree with the Convention that ministers bear responsibility for that which occurs in their departments. But the root of this matter is the, like, is the lack of cost control measures built into the scheme. Let's remember, the brightest and best considered this scheme. It was poured over by experts within the departmental team, within a team of highly paid consultants, and indeed the Assembly Scrutiny Committee, who in fairness to them, had no more expertise in this area than the Minister herself. 
none of whom found any remote problem at the time, none of whom expressed any form of concern at the time. The fact remains, the Minister would have been rightly and roundly criticised for ignoring such advice. It would, Mr Speaker, be a bizarre state of affairs if we found ourselves in circumstances where on receipt of confirmation from internal and external advisers that a scheme were correct and proper for a minister not to follow that advice. If the advice to the minister was incorrect, then so was the advice received by the committee. The truth is that advice convinced everybody who saw it, including the scrutiny committee and every other party here. What is important here, for the sake of public confidence, is that the problem is rectified, and rectified as quickly as is practically possible, and with minimum expenditure of taxpayers' hard-earned cash. Yet, very regrettably, this has not been the focus. Even in the way in which this matter has been reported, this is reflected. If they were interested in resolving this situation effectively and efficiently, for the sake of public confidence, the media would have come forward with all the information it had at its disposal and not play this out like a soap opera. They cannot have this both ways. On the one hand, it is the gravest, most significant situation the executive has ever faced. Yet on the other, we have news. It is of critical import, but we'll let you know tomorrow or maybe next week. This sensationalist tantalising approach with a focus on he said, she said and how many people were in the room for some alleged row does nothing to foster an environment of conveying the facts with the purpose of finding a resolution as quickly as possible. Instead, ministers are asked to comment on emails they aren't shown, a line here, a paragraph there. They call for openness and transparency, with which we agree, all of us but this is the opposite of how they themselves behave. Moreover, it ignores the root of the issue that the First Minister and the Minister for the Economy have been working hard to fix the fundamental problem and rein in the costs. The First Minister has nothing to hide, nothing to fear, not the truth, as some have suggested this morning. There is nothing from which she should or will run away. What matters to her, to us and to the public is that this is fixed and who we trust to fix it. To that, end, to that end, Mr Speaker, for my part, I can say sincerely and wholeheartedly that without question or a shadow of doubt, the one person in whom I have faith to do that is Arlene Foster, MLA, the First Minister of Northern Ireland. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Patsy McGlone. Mr. McGlone. Gormaga de Corlia, I thank you, Mr Speaker. And um, today it's, it's been an interesting debate, but anyway, the nub of it has been that the inevitability of where we are today is there's been a, an everyone but Arlene tactic has been tried to dump on everyone. That's on officials, consultants, media, every assembly member and committee. However, there is a distinction. Not all of those individuals had advice to notes, to memos to the minister from spads or senior civil servants. And that's crucial in all of this. Was any detail provided to the minister or indeed her special <coughs> advisor about the risks potentially associated with this scheme? None of that was available to any of the rest of us. We certainly had no access to whistleblower letters, notes, or indeed minutes of any meetings held as a result and consequence of that. Much has been made of that too. We certainly had no ministerial power to alter significant policy controls and checks to the RHI schemes. So let's have it all out there. Not selective leading, leaking to the media and slippy oil press briefings. All the detail investigated in full and before the public eye. I have now to place on record my knowledge based on information provided by officials to all members of the Eddy Committee, and indeed a number of them are in this room and we're here for parts of the debate. The sequence of events on the RHI, as we know, on November 2012, the scheme was introduced to the non-domestic sector 
and later in December 2014 to the domestic sector. On the 11th of April 2013, the Committee asked the Department to provide biannual updates on the implementation of the scheme. That resulted in an update being received more than one year later, on the 5th of June 2014 and later on the 4th of November 2014. Despite requests for updates on a biannual basis, the Department didn't consider it necessary to provide further progress reports or updates to the Committee. Who was Minister? The June 2014 briefing to the Committee stated the current NI uptake compares favourably with the GB uptake at the same point in time on a pro rata basis. And it went on to say this suggests that the Northern Ireland RHI could experience a higher volume of applications but for smaller installations. Projecting forward, it could be expected that around 300 applications could be received by the end of March 2015. Five months later, in November 2014, the briefing again from the Department stated, as of the 15th of October 2014, Ofgem have received 308 applications. Unquote. Fact. Therefore, in November 2014, applications had already exceeded expectations for the projected March 2015 date. What was done at departmental level? Who was minister? The alarm bells were clearly ringing at that stage. Officials informed the committee on the 9th of February that the process of thinking about the issue and asking questions began in March 2015, when it was noticed the level of applications was rising. Three months after the department informed the committee of the very same fact. Officials said that the minister was formally made aware of the problem in July last year. We wonder what the informal briefings contained. That was followed by the consultation on the 22nd of July that contained proposals to introduce, among other things, demand management measures from November 2015. Given the fact that demand exceeded expectations and that there was, this was apparent from as far back as at least November 2014, did anyone in the department work out the impact of the announcement or think at least to ask this question? What impact will this July announcement have on the level of ap applications between now and February and the introduction of new measures in November? And on the back of that, what advice was provided by the departmental officials to the Minister? Even on the 3rd of September 2015, the Enterprise Committee received the RHI amendment regulations where it was continuing Member to refer to the recent success. There is no sight of any urgency there. The level of detail, we need a full public inquiry, and that rests with the First Minister. I call Mr. Jerry Carroll. Uh, we're here today to discuss the scandal around the renewable heat incentive scheme, a scheme which saw hundreds of millions of pounds of taxpayers' money going up in smoke, hundreds of millions of pounds given to businesses in a lucrative handout that encouraged them to burn to earn, a scheme that gave money to a car showroom with Ferraris at the front, empty sheds with 12 heaters on full blasts, money down the drain while people lie homeless, lie on hospital waiting beds in our cramped hospitals. This is not a, just a scandal, it's a crime against the people of this region. So the question, Mr Speaker, everyone wants answered, is who benefited from this scheme? How many people linked to the executive parties benefited from this scheme? And where does the money trail lead you? I want to support this motion, Mr Speaker, but I also want to call for immediate elections. It is the only move that now makes sense. The executive has now lost the confidence of the electorate and people are outraged. They're furious. The people of the North should now have the chance to register this disgust at the ballot box. And last week, Mr Speaker, the First Minister said arrogantly that she has nothing to hide, but she certainly does. She was the architect of this whole scheme and she intervened on several occasions to keep it in operation, despite warnings from senior civil servants and others about the scheme. This isn't some administrative error or something that Arlene can pass the buck on. Nowhere else in the world would politicians be allowed to get away with this, and her position is untenable. She should do the decent thing and step down. And if she doesn't, then we have to ask where the accountability is. People are beginning to draw the conclusion that it's one rule for the executive and ministers and another rule for everybody else. 
When teachers took strike a few weeks ago, they were told that the money wasn't there. When welfare reform was rammed through, people were lied to and told there's no money to pay your benefits. People in my constituency, Mr Speaker, are unable to afford to heat their homes and have to choose between heating and eating this winter. And all the while, we found out that quite literally, money was being burned. £485 million squandered on this scheme. What does this say about the priorities of this executive? Mr Speaker, only one question needs answered today. Either there is a culture of gross incompetency within the executive, or there is an endemic culture of corruption. Which is it? And time after time, Stormont has been racked by scandal. Red Sky, NAMA, Social Investment Fund, and now RHI. And people can be hauled up in front of investigations and asked about every aspect of their life if they're on benefits. They're asked every detail of their life to try and catch them out. However, if you're a big company, you can avail of a scheme that gives you cash for ash. And if you're a politician, you can just sweep it under the rug. You couldn't make it up. And people are right to have no confidence in our politicians when they see this kind of behaviour. And the executive cannot be trusted to lead any inquiry. It must be a public inquiry, totally independent, and uh, we must have access to all the relevant documentation and personnel. And we want to see all the books opened for our HHI scheme, but also for NAMA, for SIF and Red Sky. And if Stormont won't do this, then it will only fuel an angry public who believe they are once again trying to cover up and protect their own interests. People are sick and tired of this executive. People want real change, and they want answers from the executive, not lip service. As we look across the world, Mr. Speaker, we see establishment politics everywhere in decline and in crisis. The executive should seriously consider that it too may feel the backlash from frustrated, frustrated peoples in the near future. Thank you. Call Mr. Alistair Ross. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, over the, the past two weeks, there's no doubt that it has been an incredibly difficult time for anyone involved in, in politics. It is quite clear that the public, quite rightly, are angry about a scheme that, in hindsight, was poorly designed and badly administered. But it is remarkable to hear some of the individuals who either sat as chair or members of the Deadly Committee or of members of this House who voted through that scheme to now look back with uh, being wise after the event and claiming that they knew it was wrong all along. It is a remarkable thing that everyone, including the experts who, external experts who give guidance on this, the officials who were in the energy department, the media, all of those individuals, none of them flagged up any problems at the beginning of this scheme. And that's why some of the, the hyperlay that has been around today is hard to, to stomach. Mr. Speaker, what we just heard previously from my colleague Joanne Bunting was a thoughtful and, and considered first contribution to this assembly. I think one that shows that she will be a valuable asset to this chamber. But it stands in sharp contrast to the antics that we saw from other members of this House this morning when the opposition parties to a man and woman walked out of the chamber and lodged a protest outside giving interviews to the, the media. It was pantomime politics at its very best and shows that opposition parties are more interested in stunts than solutions. What it means, well again I hear the leader of the Alliance Party chirping away in the, in the background. Let me, say, let me say to her and others, and I listened to her contribution, where she, let, she, she must have had about 10 or 11 questions that she wanted answered. Well, her constituents would quite rightly have expected her to turn up this morning when the First Minister stood at the dispatch box and she could have asked those questions and she could have got those questions answered. But she didn't. She didn't. She chose instead to go out to the Great Hall and give an interview about a range of issues that, quite frankly, the public don't care less about. It is becoming increasingly clear, as this has gone on and on and on, that the First Minister in her current role and her previous role, acted at all times uh, in the highest uh, regard. She hasn't done anything wrong. She acted appropriately at all times, as indeed her permanent secretary said in front of the PAC, and she has made herself available uh, to answer all of those questions. Mr Speaker, in the last two weeks, we've also had the rather embarrassing circumstances where leaders of the opposition have put themselves on the airwaves not to make an informed contribution, but to ask presenters questions of what's going on. And I know hard, that habits die hard for some individuals of asking questions rather than trying to answer them. But what we had is not opposition 
driven policies or, or holding the executive to account. It's a media driven thing that some of the opposition parties have tried to jump on the bandwagon for. I've just heard Mr. Carroll make a comment that the executive or that the First Minister is trying to sweep uh, these issues under the carpet. Mr. Speaker, for her part, the First Minister has, as soon as this issue became a live issue, she gave an interview from China where she was over trying to get more jobs for Northern Ireland and get more investment and help our economy. She said that she will waive convention and go in front of the PAC, again, not something that we do willing to hide. She has supported over the weekend an independent investigation into everything that's going on in the RHI scheme. She has been working with the Economy Minister to try to make sure that we have something in place in early January to stop the costs of this scheme and, and, and reduce the costs. And of course, again, some of the ill-informed commentary we've heard from uh, Mrs. Bradley, from Mr. Carl, again, they're talking about this £400 million squandered. It's not. I don't know how many times they have to be told to understand that this money has not all been spent. And that's exactly why the First Minister and the Economy Minister are working to try to reduce that uh, cost. And of course, today we had the First Minister uh, recalling the Assembly in order to give a statement and answer questions. And when she did, what did other members of this House do? They walked away. They abandoned their seats and they failed to discharge their duties or ask the questions that their voters might quite rightly be asking them to do. Mr Speaker, the public care very little about procedures, points of orders or standing orders. What they saw this morning was a First Minister making herself available to answer questions and opposition parties running away and failing to answer them. Mr Speaker, let me just make some final comments about what we have in front of us. This is an exclusion motion in front of us today. It's not a, uh, it's not a, a, a vote of no confidence. Uh, it's nothing other Ask than an exclusion member to motion, which is used for the most serious of offences. Mrs Foster has not been found guilty of any offence. She hasn't been found guilty of any wrongdoing, and we absolutely want to see the facts of this come out. We want to support the PAC investigation. We want an independent commission, Members, and we want fairness up. to be... Call Mr Philip Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, we've been called back from recess, supposedly, to help restore the public's confidence in our government. Today's events and lack of action from the First Minister and the Executive to tackle RHI has no doubt diminished the reputation of these institutions even further. We now have to wait for some unspecified time in the new year until we see both an action plan for our RHI and a budget for this government. We needed to see leadership today, leadership from the First Minister, leadership from the Executive. The opposition are doing our part, playing our role in holding this government to account. We have been raising this issue again and again in recent months, and now the BBC, via the Spotlight and the Nolan Show, have gotten their teeth into the story. And I, I pay tribute to their journalistic endeavours, as this issue is now rightly top of everyone's agenda. 251,000 people sat up to watch Stephen Nolan's expose last Thursday night, a testimony to the theatre of good journalism but also the interest and concern of the people of Northern Ireland in getting to the bottom of this mess. This scandal, and let's be in no doubt, it is a scandal, has hit home with people much more than the litany of previous allegations and problems that have beset this government. The spat between Mr Bell and Mrs Foster was certainly jaw-dropping television. The waste of money. He says DUP spads overruled him. She says it was his decision alone. The emails. He says DUP spads tried to change the email evidence trail. She says there was no attempt to remove references to her department and OFM DFM. And of course the row. He says she was hostile and abusive. She says he was physically intimidating. But the focus must not be on the personality fight between, in their words, aggressive Bell and hostile Arling. The critical issue is the 485 million of our money that has been needlessly committed and the key word here is committed to a damaged scheme. Who is responsible? Who is accountable for this debacle? Did the penny really only drop when the Treasury refused to pay the overspend? Was it OK to fleece the UK Treasury? Our taxes too, don't forget. But the you-know-what only hit the fan when the block grant was impacted? This is why we need a full investigation. The public demand answers, and this time we cannot and will not be punted into the long grass. It is also why the First Minister cannot credibly continue in her role until this scandal has been properly investigated. <coughs> this time, the scale of this failure is so enormous, so unique, that it requires an exceptional response. Although, of course, a First Minister standing aside in Northern Ireland is not exceptional. 
We've been here before. And Mrs. Foster played a key role herself, not once, but twice. This time, it is different. Previously, Mrs. Foster had stepped in for Mr. Robinson for a period of six weeks, the maximum allowed, and either to create space for Mr. Robinson to deal with his family difficulties resulting from his wife's actions, or more recently, as a political tactic to get him and his party out of a hole. This time, Mrs. Foster must stand aside to account for her own actions, her responsibility for the design and outworkings of the disastrous RHI scheme. Leadership, Mr. Speaker, as I said at the start, this is about leadership. The First Minister needs to think of what is best for Northern Ireland, not what is best for herself as a leader or for the DUP. Not party first, but country first. Brazening it out is not a sign of strength, but of weakness. The DUP can, of course, vote against everyone else and win a party victory, which will only further undermine public confidence and understandably push the public towards the Trumpism of wanting to drain the swamp. And who could blame them? We also need to see leadership from the other partners in government, from Sinn Féin and the Justice Minister Claire Sugden. Or, as Jonathan Bell correct, it is all about collective responsibility. In conclusion, Mr. Speaker, the public expect action on this issue. They rightly want an apology, action to mitigate the liability to the public purse, and to see those who were responsible to be accountable for their actions. First Minister, this happened on your watch. Under your leadership, you need to go until this scandal has been fully investigated. I support the motion. Call Mr. Jim Allister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The First Minister clearly doesn't get it. Otherwise, she would not be trying to spread the blame to everyone but herself. But the public and the taxpayer certainly get it because they see right to the heart of this matter, that the minister who signed off this flawed scheme, who consciously, deliberately took out the tariff tiering that was in the GB template and put in only the high tariff, that that minister and no one else is the author of this squander made instalment. And there's no hiding place for the First Minister on that seminal issue because it is her signature and hers alone which signed off this scheme on the 13th of April 2012 when she signed the declaration, I have read the regulatory impact assessment and I am satisfied that the benefits justify the costs. Signed Arlene Foster, Minister of Debt. Not signed by some hapless civil servant. Not signed by some nameless consultant. Signed by the Minister. And yet, when faced with the consequences of her negligence, Oh, it's the civil servant's fault. It's the consultant's fault. It's even Mr. McLuhan's fault. It's all our faults. But it's not Arlene's fault. Sorry, Arlene Foster and Arlene Foster alone signed this scheme into existence. And from that flows the runaway nature of this scheme and the debt of the future. But you didn't just fail there. In 2013, Cambridge Economics said you need to get tiered tariffs into this scheme. Department on Arlene Foster's watch ignored it. In 2014, Ofgem said the same. You need to get tiered tariffs into this scheme. On Arlene's watch, ignored. And when this scheme was approved, in 2012 by DFP, by their supply officer. The letter of approval said, this scheme must be reapproved in March 2015. The responsibility for ensuring that happened rested with Detty. But it didn't happen. Because again, asleep at the wheel, 
and the opportunity to correct it, to catch on, to get the tearing into it, was missed. And all the department can say is administrative oversight. No, not administrative oversight. Minister asleep at the wheel. And then, lo and behold, when suddenly they catch on, this did need to be reapproved. It is finally sent to DFP. And who is the minister by that stage in DFP? Mrs. Arling Foster. And who in October 2015? And I remind the House, this is at the height of the spike of applications. Right at the height of the spike. Who is the minister heading the department that in October 2015 reapproves the scheme? Mrs. Arlene Foster. So whether in Betty or whether in DFP, asleep at the wheel. And yet, yes. Me that uh, the attempt of the DUP to uh, cast the blame across the chamber ignores the fact that the scheme voted for in February by the opposition was the amended scheme. Absolutely, we heard some Member nonsense has today. An extra minute. Thank you. We heard some nonsense today that we all voted. Some of us voted against the closure of the scheme. No, we did not. We voted against the closure of the amended scheme. The scheme that was amended in November that put the tears into it, that was then rectified, then became a fair scheme. That's the scheme that was closed in February 2016. Not, not the scheme in its original form with its runaway expenditure. That's the scheme that the DUP brought in and that the minister repeatedly endorsed. And then there's the question. We've heard much talk of affirmation, oh, we want public inquiries, do you? Because if you do, then you'll commit to one under the Inquiries Act, because only such an inquiry can call witnesses, compel witnesses. But there are DUP members on these benches who could tell a lot about this scheme, who could tell about their party donors who have benefited. Lord Morrow, the party chairman, has disappeared. He could tell us quite a lot about party donors who benefit. Ask, ask there, the are other members, his remarks. there are other members on those benches whose friends and family benefited from this scheme, as well as the friends and family of SPADs. But it's everyone's fault. Members, but time is up. Sorry, that's not how the public. Call Mr. Edwin Poots. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. If uh, Mr. Allister had stayed in the chamber as opposed to. Uh, shutting out at the back of the flock like a little sheep, um, then he would have heard what the First Minister had to say. And uh, the First Minister um, indicated that she was sorry that the initial scheme did not contain cost control measures, that there were fundamental flaws in its design, that it is the deepest political regret of my time in this House, and as Minister I accept responsibility for the work of, of my, the Department during my time at Derry. Now, at least the First Minister is taking responsibility. Mr Allister, on the other hand, whenever it actually come uh, to, to voting on this scheme, pushed and pressed that it's kept open until the end of March. Until the end of March. Now, he's had his, he's had his opportunity and, and berated everyone, so he can actually listen for a moment or two instead of trying to talk over the top of people, because he ain't going to succeed. Mr Allister would have cost us more money as would all of the opposition parties who have Ask spoken Mr. today, not to the, speak SDLP, from the SDLP, the Ulster Unionists, the Alliance, they would all have put that bill of over 400 million up further because they pressed for the scheme to be kept open for longer. What we have today, Mr. Speaker, what we have today is the actions of a lynch mob. Because here we have the First Minister. Here we have the First Minister who has come before this House and there is not any evidence whatsoever against her at this point, but we have a demand that she stood down, that she moves away, that she cannot do her job. Let us go through the proper uh, way of doing things, which we have grown up uh, in, in this United Kingdom. The British way of doing things, that is that people People are found uh, innocent until proven otherwise. 
Mrs Foster has done her job in an exceptional way throughout all of the positions that she has held and has been a superb First Minister. And I find it actually, absolutely amazing to see so many of the women, whenever we actually have a woman First Minister, want to drum her out of office. Uh, that, 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 that is a disgraceful action on the part of, part of those members. Mrs. Foster, Mrs Foster has done an exceptional job as a First Minister, and we will be back in her. She will not be going anywhere. She will not be stepping aside. Get the message, folks. She will not be stepping aside. Also get the message in relation um, to, to, to the reviews of this. There will not be a public inquiry. There will be an open and transparent inquiry. And that will be a matter, because I'll tell you why there won't be, I will tell you why there won't be a public inquiry. Whenever I took on the Office of Health, I was informed that Minister McJimsey had asked for a public inquiry on hyponatremia. Mr. Allister, who, who's just jeered me, asked a question the other day, how much has it cost so far? And I think the answer was around 15 million. I'm sure he, he, 13 million. Thir, 13, yes, just let's, get, let's, let's hear it again. 13 million pounds to get the answers on hyponatremia. Now that was asked for something like six, seven, eight years ago. And we still haven't heard those answers. So, no, not give away, I have time. Um, we haven't heard those answers. And the truth is, hyponatremia issues have been dealt with by all of the health services responsible to ensure that the mistakes that happened then wouldn't happen, uh, wouldn't be repeated. So let's be very clear, we do not need to get into a process that lasts seven or eight years to be seeking for answers and spending tens of millions to identify the answers. So we will not be going down that route. And you can jeer all you like, that is just not on the table. And I'll give away now. Member for giving way, and, and, and the member has importantly reminded the House that he did indeed serve as a DUP minister. Can I ask, Mr. Poots, were you aware of a system of collective responsibility operated by the D, uh, DUP team of special advisers during your tenure? Well, uh, I think uh, everybody that's in this House uh, knows the issues of collective responsibility, and where you have those cross-departmental issues. Um, those kick into place. Uh, but in certain respect of that, I can assure the member that as a minister, I made the decisions, and no SPADs made decisions for me. And I would hope that whenever Mr Kennedy was a minister, no SPADs made decisions for him. That's just a fact of life. I made the decisions, and I stood over my decisions, sometimes right and, uh, and, and other occasion wrong. Maybe what actually Mr Kennedy is leaning to is he's maybe actually going to go on a mission in terms of the ferry that he commissioned at 5.7 million that's actually docked down in Strangford. Well, I'll take Mr Kennedy's word for it, but, but I do, do recall that when he was in office the lights, the lights were off, even though someone was at home. But nonetheless, uh, we, we, have, we can all castigate uh, various parties. The truth is, this has been unbefitting of this House today. We've had the walkouts, the temper tantrums, the grandstanding, and all of those things. That, 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 that does not add anything to this House. In fact, the, the opposition has came from the biased, BB, biased Broadcasting Corporation, as opposed to the members of this House who have been weak and inept. Before I call Ms Clare Sugden, can I ask the members to be clear that they are making their remarks through the chair? Clare Sugden. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I rise to speak as an independent member for East Londonderry. The events that have unfolded, unfolded today and throughout this past week are a farce. I would kick the House of Cards down myself if Northern Ireland didn't have so much to lose. And let it not be forgotten by all sides of this House that I have the capability to do just that. I didn't come back this morning, Mr Speaker, because I didn't want to take part in the theatre. I was elected to serve the people of East Londonderry and then the Justice Minister to serve the people of Northern Ireland. And I am so privileged and fortunate in both roles given to me. And I am therefore deeply embarrassed as a member of this Assembly to witness the antics of this morning and the consistent berating of each other. People are angry, disappointed, weary, and they should be. Regrettably, it seems that we are demonstrating contempt for the people of Northern Ireland. 
And I do not speak for others, only myself, when I say that I am sorry that we, as an Assembly, have not been able to do what you expect of us, what you deserve from us. When I was elected in May, I promised my constituents that I would address issues relating to older people, children and young people, domestic violence, mental health, and I do believe that I'm fulfilling those promises with my executive colleagues. So I will stand by my recent comments that the executive was working. Because for the first time since the Good Friday Agreement, there is genuine acknowledgement amongst government partners that we must work together in the interests of the people of Northern Ireland. And we were. And that's uh, what the people want from us, Mr Speaker. That's what they expect from us. Nonetheless, the controversy surrounding the RHI scheme is devastating. The commentary is shocking. Allegations of corruption and cronyism make me feel sick. The potential cost is unfathomable. And I certainly support a full, independent investigation, judicially led if necessary, to clarify, substantiate information now in the public domain, and indeed information that's not. We must also seek to mitigate the devastating financial effects of this flawed scheme. Mr Speaker, I won't be supporting the motion tabled by the opposition and smaller parties, because I believe it to be premature. You're asking me to support a motion that excludes the First Minister on the basis of no confidence. My confidence in the First Minister, or indeed lack of confidence in the First Minister, will be based on substantiated information, not allegations manifested in the media. Particularly as Justice Minister, it would be remiss of me to pass judgment without a full investigation or full hearing. No court in the land would do so, Mr Speaker. So why is it appropriate in this House uh, to do so today before a fair, independent investigation? The motion is premature. And if you will indulge me for the record, Mr Speaker, and the, po the point that I wish to make thereafter. As Justice Minister this morning, I asked my Permanent Secretary to investigate allegations made in the media yesterday, suggesting that the Department of Justice in the previous mandate, amongst others, were also informed about the flaws of this scheme. Now, Mr Speaker, I am not suggesting that we table a motion of exclusion for those highlighted in the article, but I will suggest that we have an investiga investigation that will take into account all executive departments, ministers, special advisers, officials and others, and define what, if knowledge, uh, they had in the flaws of the scheme, or what they were aware, through any means, alerted to concerns about the scheme, and if they acted upon this knowledge. Public, not yet, public confidence in our institution is at its lowest. And I regret to say that this is a house of cards, and it is fragile. But I don't believe a successful motion today will ensure public confidence. It will bring the cards down, and I'm not sure any of us will get up again. And the people that will suffer the most, Mr. Uh, Speaker, are the people of Northern Ireland. So I think what we need to do to ensure uh, confidence moving forward is, is to uh, announce a full independent investigation. Thank you. A point of order, Mr. Ford. Uh, Ms. Silkton started speaking as an independent member and then chose to speak as minister. She alluded to events in the department whilst I was Minister of Justice and declined to take an intervention. Can I put it on the record that I am absolutely content, having had a discussion with the Permanent Secretary this morning, that any papers involving my time in the Department of Justice should be released to a judicial-led public inquiry at the earliest possible time? Remarks on the record, Mr. Ford. Call. Call Mr. Christopher Stalford. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, this is an extremely serious turn of events uh, for the Northern Ireland Assembly, for the political institutions. It is right that government ministers should be held accountable for their actions in and out of office. It is right that public scrutiny should occur. It is right that people should ask questions where they see issues where they think uh, things have gone awry. And I think that that's healthy in a democracy. That's how a democracy should function. It's regrettable, therefore, Mr. Speaker, when after a week, more than a week, of people taking to the airwaves, casting aspersions, demanding answers from the First Minister, that she bring herself here to make herself accountable. And Mr. Farry in his contribution said that he would look for a proper forum for accountability. This is the proper forum. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. We are sent here to govern for the people of this country. So if there's a proper forum 
for holding ministers to account. It's here. And people... Uh, just one second. I want to make my point. People let, had... Let, let, let me remind the member, if he takes an intervention during his speech, he will not get an extra minute with oh, no well, time. Bad luck, Stephen. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is the forum. And people had the opportunity this morning, after 10 days of accusing the First Minister of all sorts, of accusing her of going to ground and of hiding and all that sort of language that was being used, she came here and made herself amenable to all of the people who have been making those claims about her. And she sat there, she gave an account of herself, and she offered you all the opportunity to ask her questions. And the response, the response, well, oddly enough, Mr. Alistair, the First Minister has a country to run, not heckling from the sidelines. Not heckling from the sidelines. Now, why order, don't you? Order, why don't you? Order, yeah, order. Yeah. I asked the member not to respond to those remarks made from a sedentary position, and I asked the member not to make remarks from a sedentary position. I listened to, I listened to the First Minister give an account of herself, and members had the opportunity this morning. Any questions, she made herself open and available, and they chose, they chose not to take the opportunity. Now, I understand, I've been about politics a very long time, and I understand that it would be easier and more convenient, perhaps, to be going on to the airwaves and making allegations. But if you wanted questions answered, then you should have availed of the opportunity that the First Minister gave for you to ask those questions. During the course of the debate, I heard several contributions that indicate to me that people who are talking about accountability and questions that need answered aren't really interested in the answers. They don't really care about the answers. What this is about for some people, for some people, what this is about is about base politics. It's about trying to topple the First Minister and to bring down the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party. I listened to Mrs. Long's contribution, and Mrs. Long, in her contribution, um, was perfectly reasonable in, in the things that she said. But other people's contribution was actually, and truthfully, if we're being honest about it, it was malice dressed up as fairness. Because you're not really interested in the answers. What people want is a scalp. They want to bring down the First Minister as a scalp, as a political notch. And truthfully, that's not going to happen. I welcome the fact that she said there would be an independent uh, inquiry into all of these matters and I hope that it gets to the bottom of all of them and all of the paperwork and email trails or what have you that it's all put out there for people to see and make their own mind up but it's quite clear to me from a number of contributions that there have been in this house not least of all the member from North Antrim who quite frankly Arlene Foster could make every day the 12th of July and you still wouldn't be happy with her but the fact of the matter is the fact of the matter is the fact of the matter is that people have made some people aren't interested in facts they've made their mind up and mr putz was right this is a lynch mob i call mr mike nesbitt to wind up the debate on the motion and the member has 10 minutes mr nesbitt thank you very much <coughs> mr speaker um, as it happens i was uh, in england over the weekend and i'm sorry to report we are collectively a laughing stock. Uh, actually, I was picking my son up after his first term at, at university, and I remember my first term at uni in England in the 70s, very difficult with troubles in full flow. Everybody was suspicious of anybody from Northern Ireland. And of course, thankfully, we've, we've moved on from that. But actually, what we've done now is we've replaced suspicion with derision. They know about it, and we're all tarred with the same brush. So this is about the integrity of the institutions. This is about our collective uh, <coughs> reputation. And Mr. Speaker, I ask the members of the Democratic Party, Democratic Unionist Party, to consider this. Consider what you've done. You've made Jerry Adams the white knight. Jerry Adams standing forward over the weekend saying, I'm the man who will protect the reputation and credibility of these institutions. And you've done that. You have done that. 
And I listened to the First Minister over the weekend saying she looked forward to coming to this chamber today to tell us about the plan. The plan which means we will not lose £400 million. Well, I read her speech and there is no plan. And even if there was, could we believe, I'll make some progress first, could we believe the DUP because they had a plan to save the United Airlines flight to Newark, <clears throat> except there was no plan at all, and they knew it and had to issue a ministerial directive uh, to try and make it happen. We have a plan. There is a precedent at Westminster of introducing a windfall tax against excessive uh, energy costs. And perhaps Westminster should consider doing the same with this. And I know there's a convention that says they don't interfere with devolved matters, but of course, in the Fresh Start Agreement, there is that commitment that the government was going to legislate to make sure that we did not bring forward an imbalanced budget again in the future. So there's a precedent for this executive having its homework marked uh, by the big boys in London. And we have a, another plan, not just to ask Mrs. Foster to stand aside. What about the special advisers? Uh, why, why is uh, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Bullock, Dr. Crawford, should they not be on gardening leave? Is it right they're still in the department doing what they're doing uh, as we investigate uh, these issues? And I welcome, uh, at least Claire Sugden has finally spoken uh, on the issue, although I would prefer something uh, a little more definite. Mrs. Foster says she can't be across every jot and tittle. Uh, and I accept ministers don't have to do all the detail. Ministers are there to do what? To do policy. But what was the decision to take control from DEC, the Department of Energy and, Cult uh, and Climate Change in London, of renewables? That was a policy decision of Mrs. Foster's. What was it when the department decided they wouldn't cut and paste and adopt the uh, successful GB model? That was a policy decision, not a jot, not a diddle. It was a decision by Mrs. Foster on policy. And of course, it was a policy decision to adopt what we now know was the fatally flawed renewable heat incentive in Northern Ireland. With no cost control, as Mr. Eastwood uh, pointed out in his contribution, no cost control, which was in Section 9 and could have been cut and pasted. Simply put, that digression model works very simply. If there was a pound and only one person applied, they get the full pound. But if a hundred apply, they get a penny each. So you protect the integrity of your pot of money. Uh, but in Planet Foster, everybody who applied got the full pound. And that's why we are in the mess we are in. Either her fingers are all over these policies, or she was asleep at the wheel. Either way, she has to uh, stand aside. And here's something else uh, that has been done by the colleagues to my left. You have brought renewables into disrepute. I can't tell you the hundreds of people uh, who availed of the scheme in good faith and now feel that they're being looked upon as criminals. And they are not. But it's your fault <clears throat> you brought forward the scheme. Uh, I don't have time, Mr. Speaker, uh, to reflect on the contributions of everybody in a three-hour debate. Uh, I, I think actually some of the contributions from the members of the Democratic Unionist Party uh, are the most interesting to reflect on, not least Mrs. Foster, uh, who called the RHI a debacle, as indeed Conor Murphy said it was badly conceived. Uh, she said, as others have done, that this was about a ministerial scalp. It's not about a ministerial scalp, it's about ministerial responsibility. If it's going to have any meaning in these institutions, Mrs. Foster must do the honourable thing. She's complaining about trial by television. Why did she bother taking part? Why did she walk into the trial and give the interview? But she wanted to distract from the issues, didn't she? Because the Bell Foster spat is nothing more than a mere distraction. And she says we have not established the truth yet. And yet, in her contribution, she says, the truth is being twisted out of all recognition. Well, how does she know that it's being twisted if she doesn't know what the truth is? And she did not mention the email 
that may be her undoing. Sent by the whistleblower on the 3rd of September 2013 to Arlene at arlenefoster.org, which includes this. The incentive to use more is leading to misuse in some cases. Black and white evidence that there was a fatal flaw in the scheme identified by the whistleblower who said it only took her five minutes on the internet to discover the problem. And she emailed the First Minister in early September 2013. Uh, Mr. Given says you should be innocent unless proven guilty. Unless you're Jonathan Bell, of course, Mr. Given. And the DUP are Lily White, so never mind Red Sky or NAMA or the Social Investment Fund and all the other scandals that have preceded uh, the Renewable Heating Centre. And Mr Given wants to blame the media. Well, if you think the BBC are at fault, complain. Complain to Ofcom. Michelle O'Neill said the DUP are missing the public mood and then talked about the delivery of the executive. Did anybody see the tweet from the Northern Ireland executive on Friday? This week, look what we've done. A good deal for fisheries, 23 million euro on greenways and an 8 million contract creating 170 jobs. Did they mention 400 million of an overspend on RHI? No, they didn't. A 13 million overspend on the Social Investment Fund? And no, they didn't. So they're very capable of spinning. And as Lord Morrow said in his magnificent contribution, <laughs> as he identified that some people are intent on generating a whole lot of heat. <laughs> and he talked about politicians grabbing headlines, spinning and exaggerating. And can I say to Lord Morrow at this Christmas time, it was nice to be reminded of the antics of the late Dr. Ian Paisley. <laughs> Jenny Palmer spoke as you would expect of somebody subjected to character assassination. But Mr. Hamilton, our economy minister, no acceptance of ministerial accountability, and says that oh, this is all happening at the behest of his political opponents. But Sinn Féin want it. Are they opponents? What a remarkable statement we have there. Uh, Joanne Bunting making uh, a maiden speech after all this time. Talks about fairness and natural justice once again. Is that being afforded uh, to Mr. Bell? And no mention or acknowledgement of the whistleblower. Alistair Ross, a stunt by the opposition parties? I think not. And Mr. Putz, a lynch mob. Well, I can assure Mr. Putz, no members, no members of the third force on these benches, no red berets under our beds, Mr. Putz. In conclusion, Mr. Speaker, in the absence of a fresh inquiry, the Public Accounts Committee is the only show in town. And I would urge the members of the PAC not to vote today. Do not allow yourself to be accused of being compromised on this. Uh, Mrs. Foster says this is a debacle. The Oxford Dictionary defines that as a sudden and ignominious failure. It's a story of incompetence, ineptitude, and haplessness. So, Mr. Speaker, we will now vote. Those who go that way are voting for a career, those who vote that way are voting for the integrity of these institutions. Here, here. Members, <clears throat> before we proceed to the question, I would remind members that this motion requires cross-community support. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. no. Clear the lobbies. The question will be put in three minutes.
Members, the question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. Do we have tellers? Order, order. Members, tellers have been appointed as follows. Tellers for the eyes are Justin McNulty and Steve Aiken. Tellers for the nose, George Robinson and Adrian McQuillan. The House will divide eyes to my right, nose to my left.
Secure the doors. Order, members resume their seats. Clark, read the result. 75 members voted, of which 39 voted aye, 52%. 12 nationalists voted, of which 12 voted aye, 100%. 51 unionists voted, of which 15 voted aye, 29.4%. 12 others voted, of which 12 voted aye, 100%. The motion is negative. The motion is negative. Unfasten the doors. Item 4 on the order paper, the adjournment. The question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned. <laughs>